future June. Dam ads.
I present to you the top 10 weirdest looking dinosaurs. Uh, I want to state the obvious and tell you that I'm going to be butchering the names of these dinosaurs. Butchering the names of these dinosaurs. Tradoon 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 In 1856, the fossilized teeth of a small dinosaur were discovered in Montana. The species was aptly named Troodon, which means wounding teeth. Tradoon When evolution passed out the stealth gene, Troodons lucked out. This drawer contains almost all of the North American identified specimens of Troodon. Troodon was every inch the predator, with razor-sharp serrated teeth and large, hook-like claws. Troodon probably fed on our ancestors, the early mammals. Troodon may have posed a greater threat to mammals than any other predator on Earth. Troodon was suddenly cut down in its prime. Tradoon! It's squashed completely flat. Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. I appreciate you, Daikaiju fanboy. Thank you so much for the 10 months of support. That means a great deal to me. Welcome back. Welcome to Paleontologizing, everybody. It is great to have you here. Happy Monday, February 20th. We've got a special stream today, and, uh, oh man, I've been looking forward to this one. We've got something special cooking up on the 3D printer as well. We'll be talking about that. And holy cow, check Morticia. It's about the same dimension as the wall of a dirter. Of a dirter, there you go. Things you get at the end of the paper towels, the cardboard thing in the middle, you dirt, dirt, dirt. Well, that's what this thing is like. Thank you, check Morticia, for the nine months of support. 10 from Daikaiju, 9 from Check Morticia. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. You're the whole reason I'm here. Holy moly. For anybody who's tuning in maybe for the very first time, allow me to introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. As you can probably guess, looking at my office here. Um, see anything new, long-time viewers? Anyway, uh, yeah, I work on dinosaurs. Group would dominate and it would last forever. It's Daddy, true, a truck horn. It's true. Thank you for the nine months of support, truck horn. Thank you so, so much. Really appreciate you and everything you do. Truck horn, by the way, I have the Sharpies arrived. You sent those too, right, truck horn? Where are they? Up here, I think? Anyway, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Well, where was I? Yeah, introductions. If anybody's new, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Danny Anduza. I work on dinosaurs. I dig up dinosaurs across the American West with different museums. I study dinosaurs. I publish on them. And uh, nowadays, I talk about dinosaurs five days a week right here on Twitch. So if any of you are... I mean, who among us does not have questions about dinosaurs? Everybody's got questions about dinosaurs. Or about... Evolution, natural history, extinction, cladogenesis, 
whatever. If you've got questions about natural sciences, then I'm here to try and answer them for you. Holy cow, holy Lifton. That is extraordinary. Thank you so much for the gift subs there. My goodness, holy cow, 10 of them. Uh-oh, that's 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 a lot of gift subs. Might want to take cover. Um, Holy cow. Holy Lifton, that is extraordinary. Thank you so much. Look, we're already one quarter of the way to our sub goal for the day, thanks to Holy Lifton. So thank you, thank you for that. Extraordinary. Like I said, um, thank you for your incredible support. That's the whole reason I'm able to do this five days a week is because of wonderful supporters like you. Making a contribution like that to uh, make sure I can stay on the air and talk about fossils, do my science outreach five days a week. So I appreciate you, holy left and holy moly. Yeah. And uh, Cassie Graceface got a gift sub. Cassie Graceface, where do I recognize you from? You've been here before, right? Or maybe from Io's channel? Anyway, it's great to have you here. Uh, from Io's channel, excellent. Cassie Graceface, welcome, welcome. You'll never guess who is staying at my apartment this week. <laughs> which two other Twitch broadcasters are staying at my apartment this week with their three cats? Uh, yeah, they might make cameo poppins. We'll have to see, Jody Fish. We'll have to see. But, uh, yeah, Ios and Lordy are... They're having some work done on their house. I think uh, something to do with asbestos. They're getting uh, more asbestos installed. They love their asbestos, apparently. So anyway, while that new asbestos is being installed, uh, they and the cats are staying with me in my apartment. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, so maybe they'll make some cameo poppins. We'll have to see. But today, today, everybody, today we're talking about Megalosaurus, the first dinosaur to ever be scientifically named. We're going to talk about what makes it special, what makes it mysterious, and uh, what's changed about it in the time since it was first published on, way back in 1824, 199 years ago. It was actually 199 years ago to this very day that Megalosaurus was first officially announced at a meeting of the London Geological Society. Or the Geological Society of London. I don't know. By William Buckland. We'll be talking about that. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, anyway. Uh, and don't I have a small apartment? I do, Dr. Javasaurus, but you know big enough for one paleontologist and two women and three cats, I suppose. Um, yeah. One of whom, hello, Mini Pie. We'll see if she wants to make an appearance. One of the cats just waltzed into the room right now. And holy cow, Victorious! Victorious, thank you so much. Victorious gifted Victorious a subscription. Oh, baby! Triple. Victorious. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for those three gift subs. Really appreciate that. Hey, Mini Pie, you want to come up here? Come here. Want to say hello? I got the one of the cats right here. The most outgoing of the bunch, Mini Pie. Hi. You want to come up here? You want to say hello to the good people of Twitch? Or no? You gonna be shy? That's not like you. <laughs> Anyway, she'll probably be jumping up on the desk at some point. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. It is Mini Pie now, yeah. And, uh, and Vigilanta, I've never actually been a cat owner, but I've taken care of many other people's cats over the years. And, I don't know, what can I say? I'm, uh, I adore my fellow mammals for the most part. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, she might go up to the 3D printer. She's actually looking at the 3D printer right now, because it's Mini Pie. 
Would you like to see what's going on on the 3D printer right now? Would anyone like to take a guess as to what this might be? We're talking about Megalosaurus, and holy cow. Yeah. I, uh, oh man, am I excited about this. We'll talk about it in a bit, though. But, uh, yeah. What do you... Mini Pie. Hey, that's not for you. That's not for you. <laughs> that's not for you, Mini. Oh, goodness. Anyway. Yeah. And it's not the end of a femur. No, it's it's actually much more charismatic than that, Bridget that on, but we'll be talking about that, too. Yeah. Uh, anyway, before we get talking to get get to talking about Megalosaurus today, uh, the first dinosaur to ever be scientifically named, let's go through chat real quick and say hello to everybody. Uh, Kalmathor, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Okay, I've now scrolled up to the top, and well, we've already lost first of our shoot. Well, Texas Cryptid, Fall Machine, Birds are Dead on, Nerf Dermer, Lenina, how are you all doing? Welcome, welcome. Mini pie. <laughs> She's all reared up on her hind legs like a like a basal sauropodomorph. Mini pie. It's been going for like two hours now. You're just discovering it now. Anyway, she'll make an appearance at some point. You'll get to see her. Mini pie is adorable. Uh, Blinkster, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Great to have you. D Maxwell, Megalosaurus indeed. It's gonna be a fun stream. Uh, Smorphosaurus, howdy, howdy. Uh, let's see, Trekner, did I say hello to you yet? Welcome, Trekner, Vigilanta X, howdy, howdy, not the brain, what's shaken? Uh, who else do we have got? Daikaiju fanboy, how you doing, Daikaiju? It's great to have you here. Uh, Christoph Howard has returned to us as well. How you doing, Christoph Howard? Hello, hello, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. Uh, Holy Lipton, thank you again for all those gift subs. Really appreciate that. Thank you for supporting Science Outreach here on Twitch. Thanks for that. I guess you could call it a donation to uh, the Science Outreach here on Twitch. Appreciate that. I really, really do. And, uh, yeah, we've got a minute left to try and get to a level 4 hype train here. We'll see if we can do it. Uh, Victarius, thank you again for those three gift subs. Appreciate that. I do, Victarius. Yeah. Uh, Arlay, how are you doing? True to you too, Arlay. Oh my goodness, I wish I had a camera trained on this cat right now. She's up on her hind legs, just peering at the 3D printer. Ah. Uh. Let's see, Neil, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Uh, Hogan883, how are you doing, Hogan? It's not my 199th birthday, but it is the 199th birthday of Megalosaurus, I suppose you could say. Even though it is from the Jurassic period. Uh, you know, it's what, 140 million years old? 160 million years old, probably? Allosaur uh, Megalosaurus is what, like, uh, maybe early part of the late Jurassic, or maybe even middle Jurassic? We'll look that up. I forget what stage of the Cretaceous. Oh, Jurassic it is. And gratitude. Thank you very much for the 100 bits. And thank you for those bits, Vigilanta. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so yeah. Cats and Troodon share <laughs> taste for small rodents. There you go, uh, Paleo Nerd Italiano. Welcome, welcome, Paleo Nerd. Thank you very much for the 100 bits. And thank you, Hogan. I appreciate you saying that, Hogan. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for those 100 bits. Thank you for that support. You know I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, and Hydrates, thank you now. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Dr. Javasaurus. 10 to the 60 years, give or take. There you go. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> anyway. Mini Pie, do you want to come over here? Come here. Come here, Mini. Let's see if she wants to jump up on my lap. But, uh, no promises. Anyway, everybody. Currently printing... The Lectotype Specimen of Megalosaurus. If, uh... 
If you know a thing or two about dinosaurs, then you have seen this specimen before. Very famous specimen. Uh, and uh, it is currently printing on the 3D printer. Uh, I... Altogether too late, but I... Uh, should have done this earlier, but I sent an email uh, earlier last well, last week to the Oxford Museum of Natural History um, to ask if I might be able to 3D print this Megalosaurus dentary as a teaching aid. And uh, they got back to me and very kindly sent me an STL of that. Of course... For non-commercial purposes, I will not, repeat not, be selling this or offering it to anybody. This is purely for science outreach and educational purposes. You know, let's get that straight. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Oxford, England? Yes, indeed, Vigilanta. Yes, indeed. It's not quite a public file, Dr. Javasaurus. Um, in the same sense that, like, a lot of, you know this, Dr. Java Source, a lot of data is, uh, it's not necessarily, like, publicly available, but, you know, if you're gonna use it for scientific or educational purposes and you email the authors, like I did, yeah, uh, sometimes you can get your hands on that. So, big, big, big thank you to the folks at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, which is actually the repository for the original Megalosaurus dentary. So, yeah, and you were born in Oxford. Very cool, Blakester. Very nice. Yeah. Um, and very funny fall machine. You can't lease or rent it. No. Not doing trades or anything like that. Uh, this is for educational and outreach purposes. So, yeah. Yeah. And Paleonardo Thaliano. I could have just sculpted that. We will be talking about S. Humanum later in the broadcast. But yeah, Megalosaurus has got a really interesting history. And uh, to kind of get us kicked off there, why don't we go ahead and take a look at this quick video, which I think was put out by Oxford. This case. Oh. And uh, let's see if there's any good. Should be. Let's have ourselves a look here. Make sure we got our volume turned up. There we go. This case is all about Megalosaurus. It was yeah. a nine meter long lizard that roamed around. I'm sorry, what? That's not true. Megalosaurus is not a lizard. The name certainly means big lizard or great reptile. But it's not a lizard. Oh boy, we knew that back in the 1850s. But anyway, yeah, let's let's start this over. This case is all about Megalosaurus. It was a giant nine meter long lizard that roamed around Oxfordshire around about 160 million years ago. There we go. How do yeah. you know this? I mean, even I'm not that old. Well, this was first found by William. Why did he joke about being old? Is he like a really well-known figure or something like that? People say that he's old. I'm not really familiar with this gentleman, but uh, yeah. Uh, Steve Bagshot, thank you, Blankster. I don't know who that is, but uh, it's cool that he's presenting on this. Yes, I mean, even I'm not that old. Well, this was first found mm. by William Buckland. A secret him. moment in the very beginning of this strange dinosaur's life. Well, holy cow, Tommy Plotticus. Two months. That's almost a year, right? Yeah, that's almost a year. Thank you, thank you, Tommy Plotticus. Really appreciate you very, very much. Um, thank you for your ongoing support. Seriously, it means a lot. It's the reason I can continue to do this. So, uh, anyway, Tommy Plotticus, glad you're here. A geologist in the 19th century. Yeah. We'll be talking about William Buckland. By William Buckland, who was a geologist. In and it was not found by William Buckland. That part's also wrong. Megalosaurus is not a lizard, and William Buckland did not find it. 
William Buckland purchased this specimen. It was first dug up out of a, I think, a, a mine. It was deep underground in like 1790, I think, is when it first kind of the, I don't know. The first records that we have of this being a thing, I think, come from about 1790, which is a full, you know, 34 years before it was scientifically published. But, uh, yeah, yeah, William Buckland did not find it. <laughs> he, was, he was probably a child when it was first found. But, yeah. Well, this was first found by William Buckland, who was a geologist in the 19th century. He mm -hmm. realized what he had but also that there were no nine meter long carnivorous lizards wandering around Oxfordshire. So and he didn't actually realize what he had found for a good while. It took the input of other scientists of the day, people like, uh, like Georges Cuvier, you know, famous comparative anatomist from France, in order to, uh, to kind of get Buckland to realize, hey, this is unlike anything that we have walking around today. We'll be talking about that more in a little bit. So that there were no nine meter long carnivorous lizards wandering around Oxfordshire. So he reasoned that at some time in the past they must have been here, but had gone extinct. Mm. As other bones were discovered all around the country and all around the planet, the name dinosaur was thought up to describe them. So here in this case, we have the first described bones of any dinosaur. And yep. show how much our wildlife and our planet has changed through its long history. Pretty cool. Yeah, well-produced video, even if the script could have been a little bit better written. I'm sure there's other things in there that I didn't even catch that are inaccurate, but that's the thing about Megalosaurus. That's the thing about Megalosaurus, everybody, is that it's very superlative. Well, it is very superlative. It's superlative in a few ways. First dinosaur to be scientifically described. Uh, one of the first dinosaurs, yeah, reported from England, and, uh, it might be one of the first vertebrate fossils, I know it's the first dinosaur fossil, and we think it's the first dinosaur fossil to be figured in scientific literature, but anyway, yeah, why is Megalosaurus number one? Because it was the first dinosaur to be scientifically named, Pedrick, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there you go, and MacGyver, you know, we could be all, like, well, actually, about stuff like this, but the thing is, I'm just grateful that there was a cool video about that in the first place, and it's a springboard for discussion, you know? It's not doing any real active harm to anybody's understanding of dinosaurs, you know? It's not a flat earth video or anything like that. Oh, uh, so, you know, we can, uh, we can have fun with that, you know? But yeah, yeah, uh, anywho, yeah, yeah, hmm. At that time, the land of the planet was pumped together in one vast supercontinent. Snowfall? Dinosaurs soon Holy moly. Every corner of that world. Appreciate the four months of support, Snowfall. I really, really do. Thank you, thank you, Snowfall. Uh, incredible. Four months is a good while, and I appreciate you and your ongoing support. It means a lot to me. It does. Um, well, first off, before we get into, before we get deep into Megalosaurus, before we talk about William Buckland, we talk about the discovery of the fossil, talk about all that good stuff. Uh, hopefully our audio is not radically different here. But, uh, anyway. Got some changes to the officer. Did anybody spot any differences? Hmm. What is different here? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, baby Triceratops. Indeed, Neon Copycat. It's not complete yet. But, uh... Yeah. Oh, come on. Somebody else is going to spot some differences, right? There you go, Lenina. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yep, got those acrylic rods set up under our baby Tyrannosaurus, under little Chomper Rex specimen. Uh, based on Museum of the Rockies specimen, what was it? 
I forget the specimen number for Chomparex, but it's the world's youngest and smallest Tyrannosaurus. I helped uh, dig that little critter up back in 2013, 2014, under Denver Fowler with Museum of the Rockies. And, uh, beautiful. So anyway, revamping things here in the, the office a little bit. And, uh, yeah, anyway. I also have here, it's not new, but somewhere here is a dinosaur that was originally described as a species of Megalosaurus. We'll be talking about that too. Megalosaurus, holy cow, is one of these dinosaurs that is just... If you look in older literature about these animals, Megalosaurus pops up everywhere. It's what we call a wastebasket taxon, and that's by virtue of it, you know, being from so early on in the history of dinosaur paleontology. So we'll be talking about that, we'll be talking about taxonomy, we'll be talking about holotypes and lectotypes and all that good stuff. Megalosaurus is such a wonderful springboard for discussion about these things. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome. So yeah. And, uh, Mechaholic. And they're perfectly preserved. Oh no, uh oh. Cool. <laughs> Mechaholic, thank you, thank you for the 20 months of support, Mechaholic. I really appreciate you. Yeah. Dr. Javasaurus's Megalosaurus was basically synonymous with dinosaur to the public. It was the OG T Rex. It was. Megalosaurus was the first dinosaur to be scientifically described. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Hang on a second. Let me see if I can adjust this light a little bit. I think that might help. Uh, this is that. Does that improve things at all? Yeah, maybe a little. Is that better or worse? What do you think, chat? Uh, but yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Megalosaurus. With sincere appreciation and gratitude, thank you very much for the 100 bits. Thank you, Golganek. There we go, Golganek. Thank you so much for your support. Golganek purchased those acrylic rods off of the Amazon wish list. And uh, look at that now. Beautiful. I should scooch the, the baby trike a little bit closer to our uh, Tyrannosaurus, huh? You'll see now that the tail is incomplete. Also, the uh, cervical ribs aren't on yet, and the rib cage is not complete either. But let's let's scooch him over. That's a little bit better, I think. Yeah. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. So yeah, also the hips. Gotta put the pubes and the ischia on there. Gotta complete the tail. Uh, the rib cage, you'll notice. Here. You can use this. Notice the rib cage basically stops right there. Uh, in mammals, it also stops right there. We've got your thoracic vertebrae in your back, the ones that ribs attach to. And then when you get to your lumbar vertebrae, there's no more ribs. Dinosaurs are not set up like that. Most tetrapods aren't. Most tetrapods have ribs that run, you know, from the front back to the hips. So there's going to be ribs attached to each of these once I get that complete. Also, put the, Ili the ischia coming off of the ilia right there, the pubes in front and the hips. Cervical ribs are going to go along the cervical vertebrae, the neck vertebrae. And then, of course, we'll have the end of the tail, too. But uh, there's our baby triceratops as it currently stands. Pretty cool, if you ask me. Yeah. And uh, Vigilanta, I don't... 
the not, none of those cats seem to be interested in laser pointers. So yeah, yeah. But Medler, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. And Rod, we trust. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Anyway, appreciate you, Golgonek, for your support. Now this light is actually a little too intense for my eyes right now, so I'm gonna turn that down a little bit, and we'll get into talking about Megalosaurus here. see. That's tolerable. I think that'll be great. Alright, nice. So I... Not only was Megalosaurus the first dinosaur to be formally named scientifically, it's also, believe it or not, the first dinosaur to appear in a novel. From back in, I think, 1850... When was this? It's in the 1850s. Take a guess, chat. Who was the author of the first novel to mention a non-avian dinosaur? Bonus points. If uh, a non-quantifiable amount of bonus points... If you actually know the name of the, the book, too. Wasn't Jules Verne? Wasn't Charles Darwin? Wasn't H.G. Wells? No. Hmm. I'm seeing uh, some correct answers here. Yes. Yeah. The correct answer was, of course... Charles Dickens, in his novel, Bleak House. There's an audio recording of that, and uh, it's like on the first page of chapter one, I believe. So uh, let's start there. Chapter one of Bleak House. Yeah. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Public domain. Recorded Fair by use, etc. Yeah. Bleak House by Charles Dickens. Chapter One, in Chancery. Hmm. London, Michaelmas term lately over, and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall. Implacable November weather, as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth, and it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus forty feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Hoban Hill. Smoke lowering down from chimney pots. Uh, anyway, there you go. The first appearance of a dinosaur in a novel from Charles Dickens' Bleak House, published 1853. Really, there's a lot to unpack there, actually. We're not going to get too in-depth into it, but I want to kind of give you a taste for how this, this animal was first portrayed in popular culture. And how, yeah, not even too long after the name, the word dinosaur was coined by uh, an English comparative anatomist, Sir Richard Owen, already news of dinosaurs had kind of begun to, uh, to seep out into the general public. The idea that Charles Dickens, who, who, who wrote uh, A Christmas Carol, maybe his best known work today, um... Yeah, that this famous British author chose to include a dinosaur name back when dinosaurs were brand new in the opening paragraph of one of his better known novels. That's that's pretty interesting, I think. And it shows you that you know, dinosaurs stir the imagination in a way that just about nothing else does. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Bleak House. There you go. Uh, pro sign. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, all right, Lenina. I will see you soon. You drive safe. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, only 40 feet long, says Dr. Devasaurus. Megalosaurus is actually shorter than that. It wasn't that big. But here, let's... 
Let's hear that again, actually. Uh, listen closely to the description. Boarding is in the public to house by Charles Dickens. Here we go. Chapter one, in Chancery. Okay. London. Michaelmas term lately over, and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall. Implacable November weather. Mm. As much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth. So what they mean, what he means by that, there's an old idea that like all of these different rock formations on the earth had kind of been formed during, uh, I forget what this idea is called, but it's like an early idea from geology where, uh, anyway, that like many landforms and everything had been formed underneath water. We now recognize that this is complete baloney uh but it was a compelling idea at the time and so yeah yeah this idea that like the whole earth used to be covered by water and then it slowly receded and as it receded uh yeah you would get all these landforms uh you know mountains and valleys and uh alluvial fans and you would get you know fish fossils and shells on mountaintops etc this is actually like you know, uh, an idea that was considered, you know, there were serious scientists who, uh, who made these observations about the natural world, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, it looks like there was water everywhere. They didn't realize that mountains rise, that sea levels rise and fall, that, uh, you know, plate tectonics, and these other geologic forces that we have that, that form our planet, they didn't know anything about that stuff. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, and then into our description of Megalosaurus. Listen. And it would not be wonderful to meet a Megalosaurus 40 feet long or so, waddling <laughs> like an elephantine lizard up Hoban Hill. <laughs> ah, waddling like an elephantine lizard. Because, ladies and gents, uh, this is what Megalosaurus was thought to have looked like. Uh, by Victorian scientists, people in the age of Charles Dickens. This was the depiction of Megalosaurus. It was brought forth to the public. This is by sculptor Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. It really does look like a an elephantine lizard. Basically, if you took like a monitor lizard and gave it big columnar limbs like an elephant, and you made it, you know, 30 feet long. You know, nine, maybe ten meters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they didn't find the arms? They did not, Holy Lifton. They did not. And that actually brings us to a video here that we should check out. I'm so glad that I found this. Uh, just in time for today's stream. I've never seen this before today. But Megalosaurus actually helped us you know, discover what dinosaurs looked like. And by the way, for anybody just tuning in, welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. I'm Danny Anduza, dinosaur paleontologist. Oh, we got to adjust our camera here. There we go. That's better. We're all off kilter. Let's get my computer monitor in there, too. Uh, anyway, I work on dinosaurs. I publish on them. I study them. I talk about them five days a week here. Today we're discussing Megalosaurus. Megalosaurus, which was first announced at the annual meeting of the London Geological Society on this day, February 20th, back in 1824. That's 199 years ago today. You've probably seen this famous image of a megalosaurus jaw right here uh this was really the thing de resistance this was this was the piece that told victorian scientists like william buckland richard owen georges cuvier that this animal was a reptile but unlike any other reptile that lives today in england Anyway, this is from Oxfordshire in uh, in the UK. We'll be talking about the discovery and everything in a few minutes, but uh, I'm 3D printing this same beautiful specimen. 
so yeah, I feel incredibly lucky to be able to do so and be able to show that off to all of you. Uh, it's going to be very, very cool to kind of hold not just a piece of, you know, dinosaurian history in my hand, but a piece of one of the you know, earliest pieces uh, from the very earliest time in the, the history of dinosaur paleontology, dinosaur science. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, but let's check out this video from PBS Eons. I think this is going to be pretty cool. And uh, let's get our volume up there. That should be decent. Let's have ourselves a look. Yeah. No other animals from the deep past capture our imaginations like dinosaurs. Any kid old enough to hold a crayon can probably draw one, and we older kids have our own images that come to mind when we think mm. of the terrible lizards. But the reason we have to imagine non-avian dinosaurs... Of oh, hang on a sec. Uh, pseudo memes. It's even more awesome that someone scanned it in and allowed the ST STL file to be released. Absolutely, pseudo meme. I uh, was in contact with some wonderful folks from the Oxford University Museum of Natural History back in England. And, uh, yeah, they actually sent me the STL file. It's not, like, publicly available. And so, of course, I'm doing this for educational purposes, completely non-commercial. I want to heavily emphasize that. This is to be used as a teaching aid uh, to kind of give you a sense of the scale of this. And, yeah, yeah. But uh, it's such an incredible privilege to be able to do this. I'm, oh, man, this is, uh, I am super, super excited to be printing this today. I hope you realize. Um, yeah, and here, let me make sure that we've got 3D printing as one of our tags. Uh, no, it's not? Shoot. Um, 3D printing. Oh. Here, let's get rid of fossils, maybe? 3D printing. There we go. Yeah, done. Uh, anyway, yeah. Oh, sweetie pie. Want to come up here? We've got cats in the office. Uh... Yeah. Hey, sweetie pie. She's going to be shy. Moon pie. Hey, mini pie. All three cats are here. My goodness. Suddenly they come say hello. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, let's get back to our video here, and I'll see if I can coax the cats into the room. Let's start this over. Uh... No other animals from the deep past capture our imaginations like dinosaurs. Any kid True. enough to hold a crayon can probably draw one, and we older kids have our own images that come to mind when we think of the terrible lizards. Mmm. The... We'll be talking about where that name came from as well. Terrible lizards. Um. Uh-oh. Mini Pie. She's not on the 3D... Pr okay, good. Phew. I was half expecting to switch to the scene and see a cat there on the 3D printer bed. <laughs> And Procyon, I do not have any cats, but there are currently three cats who are staying with me for the week. Hey, Moon Pie. You want to come say hello? Or are you going to go hide under the bed? Are you going to go hide under, under my other desk? What are you doing? What are you doing? Let me take a picture. And I can show chat. Hey, Mini Pie. Mm -hmm. That's a terrible picture. Ugh. It's too dark in here. Anyway. Uh yeah, I'm uh Lordy and Ios's three cats are staying with me for a few days. And uh they're marching around over here. Where are you going, Moon Pie? Let's see, can we to catch one of it. Yep, there's one right there. See? Not making this up. There's Moon Pie. <laughs> Say hello to Twitch chat, Moon Pie. Yeah. 
their names are Moon Pie, Mini Pie, and Sweetie Pie. Uh, it's a long story. You can ask Ios and Lordy about those, but, uh, about those names. But anyhow, yeah. I predict before the end of the stream, we'll probably have at least one cat jump up on my desk or on my lap, and you will get to meet her. It'll probably be, it'll almost certainly be Mini Pie. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, not Kidney Pie, Bald Squirrel. <laughs> We're talking about British dinosaurs today. Bald squirrel, not British food. <laughs> oh, speaking of British dinosaurs, holy cow, Iguanodon. Uh, Dark Tarconis. Yeah, holy cow, Dark Tarconis, the big two. That's almost a whole year, isn't it? Thank you, thank you, Dark Tarconis. I appreciate you. 24 months is a long time. That's pretty extraordinary. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh,. Cinematology says, if you could be a British dinosaur, which one would you be? T-Rex. Very funny, Cinematology. I've got an answer for you. And it is Baryonyx. I'm actually working on these guys. I've got an upcoming uh, paper on Spinosaurids and their feeding ecology. Uh, these are really cool fish-eating dinosaurs with these long crocodile-like jaws. Really extraordinary critters spinosaurids the teeth didn't print on this unfortunately i need to use a smaller nozzle um but they've got these big muscular arms with these big hooked claws long skinny crocodile like jaws like this for catching fish yeah uh it's baryonyx in particular that i modeled this after i you know modeled this in 3d on my computer and then i 3d printed it so yeah and, uh, do we have an ETA on that? Not yet, Snowfall, no. There's there's just a new paper on Spinosaurids that came out last week. And I've got to revise my manuscript to include that now. Luckily, their findings largely agree with the findings of me and, and my co-author. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. And, uh... And... Attacked away what? what? <laughs> Nature to no, no nature to take care of it, lol. I don't understand tactile, but I appreciate you. Yeah. Anyway, long skinny jaws like a caiman, more like a like a gharial hogan. Um, maybe you're thinking of these guys. Uh. Yeah. Like these guys, gharial. Uh, long, thin jaws like that. They're not quite this long and thin, but they're starting off from, you know, a different starting point than these guys are. But yeah, this is actually one of the critters that I was looking at for, uh, for this upcoming paper. So yeah. Yeah, Garials, extraordinary creatures. And uh-oh, 3D printer's making some noises. Let me check on that real quick. Sorry about that. There was a globule of uh, filament was sticking up right there. 
So I'm risking a crash with the uh, extruder nozzle. Uh, if I didn't snip that part off, so... Anyway. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. And, uh... Yeah. And no, Vigilante, that's just a normal 3D printer thing. The cats are being very well behaved so far. So yeah. Yeah. And, uh, TCP? I don't know what that means, Hogan. Yeah. No, sometimes... Just, there's crud that, that accumulates around the nozzle, and then it glops off and hardens on the print. And so you just have to cut that off. And Cinematology, thank you so much for that follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing, it's great to have you here. Excellent, yeah. And uh, Schmazonium, no I didn't get cats, I've got three cats who are staying with me for this week. Mini Pie, do you want to come say hello? Hey. I'm tempted to just pick her up. She might not like it. But, uh... Here. Let's, uh... Let's grab Minnie Pie real quick. Ready? Alright, Minnie. Oh, there we go. Yeah. How you doing? Oh, ho, ho, ho. you do like being here. Sorry that I need to like lower the camera. You can't really see her. Oh, can't really see her. Oh. <laughs> you come up here? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Mini Pie is by far the most outgoing of all three cats whom I'm currently watching, and uh, she is very sweet. And uh, yeah, aren't you wonderful? Aren't you wonderful? Yeah. Uh, she's not gonna leave now. She's welcome to stay. Yeah. Yeah, I should uh, should tilt that camera down so everybody can see your beautiful face. Can I raise my... I risk frightening her off if I raise the, the level on my chair here. Uh, let's see. She's going to think I'm going to stand up and she's going to leave. Holy cow! Nerf Dermer. My goodness. Nerf, Nerf Dermer. Thank you, thank you, Nerf Dermer. Holy cow, we are now halfway to our sub goal. 20 out of 40. Excellent, Nerf Dermer. Excellent. Look at those little ears. Yeah. You come sit up here? Oh, she wants to sit on my lap. Let's see, how do I do this without disturbing you? I want to raise my chair. Yeah. Oh. My goodness. Ugh. <laughs> uh, anywho, and uh, a slobber, but a very chody fish. There's another very drooly cat. Sweetie Pie is very drooly. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah. Here, if I like, if I could grab something to sit on. Like a booster seat, then everybody could see you, Minnie. Yeah. Oh, what do you think? Should we watch that video, Minnie Pie? Let's do that. Let's start that from the beginning. There we go. There we are. Yeah. What other animals from the deep past capture our imaginations like dinosaurs? Oh, man, hang on a minute. Somebody had a great idea there. Desk camera for cat vision. There you go. Hey, Mini Pie. How are you? Do oh, yeah. How are you doing? <laughs> oh, yeah. Cat vision. That was uh, that's a great idea, Nell. I appreciate that. Oh, look at you. Look at you. You 
want to say hello, Minnie Pie? I mean, we can't really get your face in there, huh? Maybe if I turn this way. What do you think? What do you think, Minnie? Huh? Ready for your close-up mini pie? <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's get back to our video here. Or is any kid old enough to hold crayons? Was this this is the like the no other tenth time we started this? The deep past capture our imaginations like dinosaurs. Any yeah. kid old enough to hold a crayon can probably draw one, and we older kids have our own images that come. Early intelligizing. There you go, paleo nerd. Yes. But the reason we have to imagine non-avian dinosaurs, of course, is that they're extinct. Thankfully, yep. a ton of science has gone into our understanding of how dinosaurs look. By, oh, only one of these creatures is a dinosaur. This is a dinosaur. This is not. This is one of these big archosaurian reptiles. That's, uh, they were like the big dogs in that ecosystem back in the Triassic. When little dinosaurs like this Eoraptor were, uh, were just starting off. This is one of the earliest dinosaurs we have. So anyway, dinosaur, not a dinosaur. Anyway, good stuff. Looked and acted, but the truth is, we've only had a few hundred years to bring that picture into focus. So if you yeah. take a book about natural history or stroll through a museum hall, you'll get some idea of what paleontologists think dinosaurs looked like. But yep. even the most up-to-date restorations of our prehistoric favorites are only part of the story. Because our image of dinosaurs has been constantly <gasps> changing. It's Gertie. You might say, ever since naturalists started studying them about 350 years ago. <laughs> and this evolution... Yeah, Gertie the dinosaur we were talking all about. Good old Gertie. Last week. Uh, was it last week or the week before? Anyway, I did a whole live stream about Gertie the dinosaur. And, uh, you know, sauropod dinosaurs, depiction of dinosaurs in animation. It's one of the earliest cartoons. And, of course, it's a dinosaur. This is the, the first keyframe cartoon. Key, the first ever keyframe animation sequence was for Gertie the dinosaur. We back in, what, 1913, I think? 1914? Pretty cool that, like, uh, this new technology, keyframe animation, the first time it was ever used, it was to resurrect a dinosaur, you know? Pretty neat how technology and dinosaurs often dovetail like that. Uh, when we've got a new way of, uh, you know, depicting something, usually one of the first subjects is a dinosaur, because everyone loves dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah. Cool stuff. Rip. There we go. Years worth of drawings about 350 years ago. And this evolution yeah. is reflected in hundreds of years worth of drawings, paintings, and models of dinosaurs, each made in an attempt to get us a little closer to visualizing animals that have been lost to time. Taken together, yep. these pictures can tell us a whole lot about just how much we've learned in just a short three and a half centuries. So mm -hmm. today, we're going to explore the history of dinosaur science as seen through the history of dinosaur art. Pretty cool, and this will also involve Megalosaurus, which is why we're watching this. started to find dinosaur bones that didn't uh, quite know what to make of them, as you can tell from the very first illustration of a dino fossil ever published. Back in yep. 1677, more than 160 <laughs> years before the word dinosaur was even coined, an English chemist named Robert Plot published his Natural History of Oxfordshire, a catalog yep. of rocks, minerals, and fossils <coughs> from his home county. And it included a drawing of a strange bone that had been found in a limestone quarry. So yeah, this strange bone. There, I uh, we'll talk about in a minute what it was called, but uh, yeah, here's a reminder. Let's try and keep things PG rated, you know. There's gonna be some human anatomical terms, you know, bits of male anatomy that are discussed here. That's not what this is, but it certainly looks like that, and. Was one of the names that it was given. So let's just, you know, here's a reminder. Let's be mature about this. And remember that this is a family broadcast. So don't go too blue with your humor, okay? Anyway. Yeah. Pod could tell that it was the end of a femur or a thigh bone. 
Yep, and let's put our captures back down here. But it was clearly from an animal far larger than any. Yeah, it's a knee joint. There you go, Jody Fish. Yeah. Suggested that the thigh fragment might be larger yep. than so, yeah. any. This is a human femur. This is the right femur right here, viewed from the back. Because uh, you can see there's the femoral head. And then, uh, yeah, this is basically the back of the knee is what you're looking at right here. With those two bulbous things like that. So that's clearly what we call the distal end of a femur. Yeah. Uh, here we go that had been found in a limestone quarry. Plot could tell that it was the end of a femur or a thigh bone, but yep. it was clearly from an animal far larger than any living in England at that time. Mm -hmm. It suggested that the thigh fragment might have belonged yeah. to a Roman war elephant or maybe even a giant human. But it turned out that in his book, Plot had given the world its very first scientific illustration of a dinosaur fossil. This is true. We now think this is probably from... Megalosaurus. It's really difficult to tell 100% for sure. Although we'll be talking about that also. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and Birds are Dead On says, I summed up everything I wanted to say in a finch face. Finches can be remarkably expressive birds, Birds are Dead On, and I appreciate you using them so skillfully. Yeah. In 1763, English naturalist Richard Brooks reprinted Plot's illustration in a six-volume set he called A System of Natural History. And Brooks mm. bestowed a name on the fossil. In a caption of Plot's picture, he called the specimen Scrotum Humanum because... Really? Because... All... Yeah! Uh... I think it was kind of a joke at the time. This is clearly the end of a femur. It's the distal end of a femur. And we'll see some actual, you know, photographs of it later. Uh, Darren Nash actually had a really interesting post on his blog about this. He's a British paleontologist and zoologist. Um, Although yeah, he knew it wasn't yeah. a femur, he thought it looked like a pair of human testicles. Paleontologists now know that the bone belonged to a megalosaurus, a dinosaur named by William Buckland in 1824. Working from... Yeah... Named in 1824, 199 years ago, William Buckland first announced his discovery of Megalos or his, he first announced the name Megalosaurus, or he announced his intent to publish on this, uh, on this very day in 1824, on February 20th, at the meeting of the London Geological Society. So yeah, Saurus, yeah. A dinosaur named by William Buckland in 1824. Working from yep. some more and the first dinosaur cereal, named. including a lower jaw and teeth, Buckland was able to tell that this animal was a previously unknown kind of carnivorous reptile. To Buckland's mm. mind, the creature looked not like a giant or even an elephant, but like a crocodile, although one hmm. about the size of a bus. And from this time, we still have a <laughs> lithograph of the crucial fossil, the one that established Megalosaurus as a new, fierce form of ancient life. This is the same one that I tweeted earlier right here. There we go, on the Bird website, announcing today's stream. And let's see, holy cow. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot, some likes and some retweets. Not too bad for engagement, you know? Yeah, could definitely be worse. Anyway, that is what's currently 3D printing. This specimen right here, from the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, uh, some of the folks there were kind enough to send me an STL file of this so I could 3D print it for outreach purposes. So there it is right there. We're going to be using this as a teaching aid once it's done. It should be almost finished by the end of today's stream. So, uh, yeah, you can see the contours, the bottom of the jaw right there. And the teeth are going to be jutting up in probably a couple of hours. Uh... But yeah, very, very excited about this. What an extraordinary, extraordinary piece of history in the very earliest days of dinosaur paleontology. Yeah. And Bertrand then on says, what are these shark teeth looking things on the jaw? Those are more teeth. You know what? Maybe it's time to actually talk about that before we continue our video. Uh, let's see... Here is an article about this from Sci News. 
Uh, this is from June 7th, 2017. Beautiful paper alongside this. Pioneering technology sheds new light on Megalosaurus, world's first scientifically described dinosaur. A state-of-the-art CT scanning technology has shed fresh light on Megalosaurus Bucklandi, the first dinosaur ever named and described scientifically. Next to new research at the universities of Warwick and Oxford, UK. So this is what Victorian natural historians or uh, natural philosophers, they didn't even really call themselves scientists at the time, but uh, geologists, I suppose, or comparative anatomists. This is what they thought Megalosaurus looked like back then because they had very limited material from it. This is a much better depiction of what we think it looks like today. It's a two-legged carnivorous dinosaur. But since Megalosaurus was the first dinosaur of its kind ever found, and they only had a few bits and pieces, this is the idea they came up with for what it would have looked like. They were doing the best they had, the best they could with the material that they had at the time. You know? So yeah. Yeah. Uh, but what's going on with those different sizes of teeth? Like you see right here. But we'll talk about that. Uh, well, here. This is the actual specimen right here. And you can see, here is one tooth that is fully erupted. You know, it's already out and about doing its thing. Right there. The rest of the teeth had fallen out, but these teeth are growing in to replace those lost teeth. So dinosaurs... Just like sharks, just like most vertebrate animals with teeth, they never ran out of teeth during their lifetimes. They're just constantly growing new teeth all the time. And new teeth would come in from the jaw, you know, they would erupt like that and they'd push out the old teeth. That's what you're seeing here. These are replacement teeth. This one's just about ready to fall out. And there's another tooth right there. It's gonna push it out. Here's a 3D model that they printed. Uh, it's got to be a resin printer, right? That's beautiful. Holy cow. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just like sharks, these animals are replacing their teeth all the time. Almost all animals with teeth. All vertebrate animals with teeth do that, except for mammals. We as mammals are weird. We've got a limited number of teeth. Very limited. As humans, we only have two sets of teeth for our whole lives. You got your baby teeth, and then you got your adult teeth after that, and then you're done. You know? Like, those fall out? Sorry. No more teeth. They break? Pfft. You're on your own. You know? That's why we have dentistry. If we were like dinosaurs, or like lizards, or like fishes, or like, you know, elasmobranchs like sharks... We would just be constantly replacing teeth all the time. We'd never have to go to the dentist. Rarely we have to go to the dentist, you know? But then we'd also have, like, snaggletooth grins all the time. We'd be missing teeth over here, and we wouldn't really have the precise bites that we get. We wouldn't have the, the beautiful, like, micron scale tooth-on-tooth uh, -tooth occlusion that uh, people have, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway... And Hogan says, some mammals, like beavers, the teeth never stop growing. Those are the incisors. Yeah, rodents have uh, incisor teeth that never stop growing. These, uh, these teeth right here never stop growing on rodents. But yeah, M Mini Pie, if it's okay with you. I've got a cat in my lap. If it's okay with you, Mini Pie, I'm going to scoot a little bit closer. There we go. Can I scoot closer, Mini Pie? Is that okay with you? that okay? Because I feel like I'm out of focus in the camera. So let's do that. Ooh, and yeah, beaver teeth are orange because of the iron content. Very cool. Rampaging in an unsuspecting world. Holy moly. Creatures from the dawn of time. Hoot House live stream. What lives will they destroy? What depths of panic and terror will they create? <laughs> Holy moly. Hoot House live stream. Thank you, thank you for your raid and welcome to Paleontologizing. Holy cow. 
It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, as you can probably guess, looking at my office here. These, I'm still in the process of getting these set up properly, especially our baby Triceratops. But anyway, it's great to have you here. Thank you, thank you, Hoot House, for that incredible raid. How was your stream? And thank you, official Nakia, for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. If anybody here is not yet following Hoot House live streams, then you are missing out. As we all know here, birds are living dinosaurs. They're the only dinosaurs to survive the end Cretaceous extinction event. Owls are birds, so owls are dinosaurs. Now the dinosaurs rule. Hoot House live stream is where you can see owls start new families, I suppose. They've got cameras set up into, like, inside of a big owl box. So you can see the owls come and go for the evening. You can see them bring prey back. You can see them, you know, court and fertilize their eggs, lay eggs. You see the eggs hatch. You can watch the baby owls grow up. It's pretty extraordinary. So if you're not following Hoot House live streams, you are... You're really missing out. So thank you, thank you, Hoot House, for your raid. I really appreciate it. It's great to have you here. Of course, I don't I don't work on birds. I work on their dinosaurian forebears as a dinosaur paleontologist. Today, we are talking about Megalosaurus. Megalosaurus was the first dinosaur to be scientifically named back in 1824 was actually on this very day in 1824 that Megalosaurus was first presented to the London Geological Society. 199 years ago on this very day, February 20th, presented by William Buckland. And this is the famous lower jaw of Megalosaurus, which was key in the description there. That's currently what I'm 3D printing here for science outreach and educational purposes, of course. And Yellow Swamp, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. And uh, Megalosaurus is a theropod dinosaur. That's a pretty decent Megalosaurus right there. Yeah. It's a theropod just like Tyrannosaurus. Yeah, basically on... The right, that's what Victorian scientists thought Megalosaurus would have looked like. Basically like a big elephantine lizard, kind of. On the left is what we think it would have looked like, according to, you know, all of our modern evidence that we've accrued about this group of dinosaurs, Megalosauridae, this whole family. And Yellow Swamp, pay to you too. Thank you for your follow. So yeah, anyway, we've got a bunch of cool new people here. I think it's probably time... For a welcome video. If you're here for the very first time, or if you'd like to see the welcome video again, type a one into chat, and I would be delighted to play you a welcome video to kind of introduce you to paleontologizing, show you what this channel is all about, all that good stuff. So if, uh, whether it's your first time here, or your 3,000th time here, uh, yeah, type a one in the chat if you'd like to see a welcome video. I'm not seeing very many ones. Well, there's a few. Okay, I suppose that's enough. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. And I'll introduce you to our good friend, previously recorded Danny. Yeah. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and bring him on. And he is already sneaking up behind me. Um... I, I can't be as loud as I, I normally am, I feel, because I currently have a cat on my lap. I've got some cats visiting me. And, uh, yeah, there's, here, Minnie Pie, you want to say hello? You want to say hello, Minnie Pie? She doesn't always show up on camera the best. Um, but she's here, aren't you, Minnie Pie? Yeah. Anyway, I've never, I've never had cats on my stream before. I'm taking care of three cats. Uh, for the week. And, uh, I'll see if, well, previously recorded, hang on. 
Well, previously recorded Danny is, uh... Is talking to all of you. I'll see if I can reposition her so you can see her better. But anyway, um... Previously recorded, Danny, it is your time to shine. Take it away. Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you're new here, then, uh, welcome to Paleontologizing. You might be wondering to yourself, uh, where's the video game? Well, my name's Danny Anduza, and I'm a paleontologist. I don't really do too much in the way of video games, I guess. I work on dinosaurs. But how does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, I'll tell you. It all started when I moved to Montana right out of high school. In my first week there, I started working in the paleo lab at Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was probably the greatest dinosaur museum on the planet. If you've ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you're more familiar with that institution and with my old boss than you may realize. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said that the guy, Alan Grant, was you. Yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> it was in that program that Jack Horner built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. I learned a lot of that from Jack Horner's last graduate student, this guy, Denver Fowler, who would go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. Under Denver, I did nearly a decade's worth of field work digging at hundreds of sites on the Upper Cretaceous, excavating literally hundreds of dinosaurs. Here's just a few highlights. In 2012, I discovered the world's oldest specimen of Gasmosaurus, hopefully soon to be published as a new species. In 2017, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. I've also been lucky enough to help collect another very important specimen, the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. And much like my fieldwork, my research is also centered on dinosaurs. Some of that deals with new genera and species, like this guy, Trurarcuncus, a bizarre little theropod from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, who was just published in July of 2020. I've got a few studies in the works right now, some of them focusing on dinosaur biogeography, and some others on behavioral functional morphology, basically looking at bizarre features of dinosaur skeletal anatomy and trying to figure out why those features evolved. And one of my current projects involves spinosaurs. But I can't really talk about that until it's closer to publication, so uh, don't ask me about it yet. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things were definitely on the decline in Montana. So I packed up and moved back to the West Coast. And I have been so much happier here. I've also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-deadening bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, I've moved my career in a different direction. And lucky for me, it happens to pay a lot better, too. I kind of stumbled my way into a job in early childhood education. I get to make a real difference in kids' lives and help instill a love of nature and a burning curiosity for the world around them. Then coronavirus descended and the school shut its doors. But I wasn't about to let a global pandemic stop me and my students. We just moved online. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things, like Velociraptors' jumps or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids who want to see them line it up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. 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 That's who I am.
having made the jump to teaching remotely, it was only a short leap from there to Twitch. I started streaming in May of 2020, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Now, it's my belief that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about your science is one of the most important things a researcher can do. Twitch is kind of an ideal medium for that. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help out by continuing to watch, or if you can afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So, for my regular viewers, thank you for sitting through that again. And uh, for everybody who's new, welcome. We've got a fantastic little community going here, and uh, we'd be really happy if you'd join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Hoot House Livestream for, uh, for your raid. Welcome, welcome, everybody. And let me know if you've got any questions. Anyway, without further ado, and uh, Mech Matt, I'm so glad you're here. Heart dinosaurs indeed. Let's get back to Megalosaurus. Uh, here it is in this video. It tells us something about how the world was 80 million years ago. Uh, Haven0320, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing Haven. How are you doing? This is what I'm currently 3D printing. Uh, can't wait until this is finished, but holy cow. Uh, yeah. The lectotype, which is kind of a designated, a redesignated holotype of Megalosaurus. Really, really cool. Let's get back to this. Yeah. Here. Le gonna rewind a little bit. But, uh, yeah. Today we're going to explore the history of dinosaur science as seen through the history of dinosaur Art. Dinosaur art. Yeah. When naturalists first started to find dinosaur bones, they didn't quite know what to make of them, as you can mm -hmm. tell from the very first illustration of a dino fossil ever published. Back in yep. 1677, more than 160 years before the word dinosaur was even coined, an English chemist named Robert Plot published his Natural History of Oxfordshire, a catalog <laughs> of rocks, minerals, and fossils from his home county. Check, Morticia. You sleep well, Morticia. I'll see you later. That had been found in a limestone quarry. Plot yeah. That it was the end of a femur or a thigh bone, but it was clearly from an animal far larger than any living in England at that time. He suggested that the thigh fragment might have belonged to a Roman war elephant or maybe <laughs> even a giant human. But it turned out that in his book, Plot had given the world its very first scientific illustration of a dinosaur fossil. In he had no idea at the time, but yeah. Richard yeah. Brooks reprinted Plot's illustration in a six-volume set he called A Where's System of Natural History. And Brooks bestowed a name on the fossil. In a caption of Plot's picture, he called the specimen Scrotum Humanum because... Really? Because, although he knew it was a piece of femur, he thought it looked like a pair of human testicles. Paleontologists now know that the bone belonged to a Megalosaurus, a dinosaur yeah. by William Buckland in 18... 1824. First announced on this very day, February 20th, 1824, 199 years ago to this very day. And Minipi just pushed the door open. Come here. Hey. Come here, Minnie. You want to come step here? She's intrigued by the 3D printer. She's like, what is that noise? Why is it why is it doing that? Hey. Come here. 1924. Working from some more and better material, including a lower jaw and teeth. Buckland was able to tell that this animal was a previously unknown kind of carnivorous reptile. To Buckland's mind, the creature looked not like a giant or even an elephant, but uh, like a crocodile. Hey, Mayor Space, how you doing? About the size of a bus. And from this time, we still have a lithograph of the crucial fossil, the one that established Megalosaurus as a new, fierce form of ancient life. Yep. There we go. These rather inauspicious beginnings, cases of mistaken identity involving war elephants and human genitals, the idea started to sink in that dinosaurs were something truly special, specifically gotcha. a kind of reptile gotcha. that used to exist 
but yeah. didn't anymore. But in the early 1800s, scientists <laughs> still pictured dinosaurs as being pretty much like the modern reptiles they knew. The English physician, Gideon Mantell. That didn't work. I didn't pick her up right. She's a very wiggly cat, you know? Anyway. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you're doing fine, Mayor Space. Minnie, you can come sit on my lap whenever you want, okay? Anywho, let's, uh... Dinosaurs Let's continue. Something truly special, specifically a kind of reptile that used to exist, but didn't anymore. But in the early 1800s, scientists still pictured dinosaurs as being pretty much like the modern reptiles they knew. The English physician Gideon Mantell, for example, figured that if dinosaurs were reptiles, then they must have basically just been giant lizards. Based on some fossil <laughs> teeth that he found in Sussex, Mantell yep. was convinced that he had found the prehistoric equivalent of an iguana, albeit one about 30 meters long. He made a sketch of the creature's skeleton yep. in his personal notes, following the same skeletal plan of the modern lizard, and in 1825, he officially gave the animal the name Iguanodon, or Iguanatooth. A few years later... Which I've always kind of wondered about this part right here. Is this supposed to be a branch or a stick? Or what's the deal there with... Uh, it almost is illustrated like a string of vertebrae or something, but he doesn't have the, uh, you know, no... No uh, metacarpals, metatarsals, no tarsals or phalanges for either of these. What's going on there? I don't know. Kind of confusing. It's a spine of his fallen enemy, says Snowfall. It could very well be. <laughs> oh, and there's Minnie Pie. There you are. You rubbing up against my microphone? Yeah. Oh. So for anybody just tuning in, if any of you have, uh, have watched... Ios or Lordy's streams, and you've already met Mini Pie. Uh, Ios and Lordy are staying with me uh, for part of this week while they have their housework done. They're, uh, I think they're getting something to do with asbestos. They're getting some new asbestos installed, I think. They must love asbestos. But anyway, while, uh, while they're doing that, uh, Minnie Pie and two other cats whoop, are staying with me. Whoop. Yeah, there you go. And Minnie Pie, you are... Oh, you're such a terror. What, what a horrid beast, Minnie Pie. What a horrid beast. What a beast you are. My goodness. You're feeling a bit cheated. Try blaming the dinosaurs. And thank you, Carbon Base Dude, for the 100 bits. I appreciate you. Oh, mini pie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look at you. Look at that tail. That's a happy tail there. Yeah. The other two cats have been kind of scarce. Um, mini pie is by far the most outgoing and adventurous. Of, uh, of the three cats. The other two, you will be very lucky if we see Moon Pie or Sweetie Pie. But Minnie Pie loves to be the star of the show, and so here she is. So, yeah. Aww. <laughs> uh, and Cat Bum and your feast means they like you. This is true, Neon Coffee Cat. This is true. Yeah. And, uh... Oh... Oh, Minnie Pie. Yeah, look at you all nuzzly. What are you nuzzling for? There we go. What are you doing? <laughs> uh, the camera does not... You're, t you're so dark for the camera. Can't focus on you properly. I guess it's also dark in this room. We need some better lighting here. But yeah... Anyway, it's good to see you, Mini Pie. Oh, thank you for that. Licks. Is that is that tasty? Yeah. You gonna you gonna eat me? Up? Oh, ow! You're biting me. What's what's up with you? You're you're crazy, Mini Pie. You're are you overstimulated? What's going on here? You're just she didn't break the skin or anything, but she. she She's sitting on me and she's biting me. Oh, mammals. 
anyway, you know what's not mammals are non-avian dinosaurs. Or really any kind of dinosaurs. Avian dinosaurs also not mammals. But uh, because they were not mammals, they kind of confused some uh, you know, early scientists studying fossils. We thought, oh, these things are like reptiles. That must mean that they're cold-blooded, slow-moving, not particularly intelligent, all that other stuff. So, yeah. Intel was convinced that he had found the prehistoric equivalent of an iguana, albeit yeah. about 30 meters long. He made a sketch of the creature's skeleton in his personal notes, <laughs> following the same skeletal plan of the modern lizard, and in 1825, he officially gave the animal the name Iguanodon, or Iguanatooth. A few years yep. later, Mantell was visited by artist John Martin. Martin was famous for his paintings of dramatic, apocalyptic scenes, like his 1822 painting, The Destruction of Pompeii, and hmm. after meeting Mantell, Tell, Martin used his vision of the Iguanodon to create the first and maybe the most over-the-top scene of dinosaur combat ever committed to canvas. Very, very cool. This is Megalosaurus versus Iguanodon here. And look at that. It is just kind of like nightmarish. My goodness. Yeah. Wow. Very. It looks like the Great Wall of China. It kind of does, doesn't it? That sinuous... Yeah, first hand. Pretty cool. This painting, the country of the Iguanodon, is all coils and teeth and claws. It's all very rare. At the time... At Mini Pie, look at you. Do you spot the camera? What do you see? What do you see, Mini Pie? Are you going to try and eat Twitch chat? Is that what you're going to try and do? Oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh, look at you. You're going berserk. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my goodness yeah she is uh she's loving this holy cow again you don't you don't show up super well on the camera mini pie you know, her fur is so dark she's like the um she's like the creatures from uh Attack the Block. Has anybody seen that? Yeah. Underrated film. Uh, but yeah, she just absorbs light. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Since much stream hijacking this week, it's already happened many times, Lenina. Yeah. Anyway. Let's get back to... Uh... Try blaming the dinosaurs. And thank you, Hogan. Love the dinosaurs and cats. Oh, get some sleep. Catch you next time, Danny. Thank you for your continued support, Hogan. I really appreciate you, and thank you for those hundred bits. It's the reason I can continue to do this is because of support from viewers like you, Hogan. So thank you, thank you, and uh, you go get some sleep, get some good rest, Hogan. I'll see you next time. I'm guessing we'll have more cat activity, uh, throughout the rest of the week. That's. I guess, but that's probably it's probably a safe bet. Yeah. Uh but man, my camera does not the camera was not built to to pick up to pick you up on yeah. You just you fade into the darkness, Mini Pie. Yeah, you look at my hand, don't bite me. <laughs> uh anyway, good stuff. Yeah. And Wolf, I don't think I've ever never ending story. I didn't I never wanted to start that now because I you know, never ending story. I'd still be watching it now, you know? Ow! Oh, those claws in my thigh, mini pie, ow. Don't put your put your claws away. That hurts. Ouch. Ugh. Get back to this guy. It summed up yeah. what dinosaur combat ever committed to canvas. This painting, yeah. the country of the Iguanodon, is all coils and teeth and claws. It's all very yeah. rare. At the time, it summed up what experts thought ancient reptiles were like. Giant, vicious mm. lizards who hissed and snapped at each other. But that was all about to change. So, Mayor Space's cats are scalawags. I don't know, Mayor Space. I think of them as being much more rapscallions, you know? 
uh, because there's there's a night and day difference between scalawags and rapscallions, you know, and it pays, it pays to know the difference. Um, I'm sure some learned members of chat can relate to us, you know, define these terms: scalawags versus rapscallions. Um, yeah, versus something which is you know entirely different. You know, you've got your your crumb bums, uh, you've got your ne'er do wells. Uh, you've got your miscreants, you know, there's a whole plethora of, uh, you know, uh, personalities like this. So yeah, I'm sure people in chat can have a field day defining these. But yeah. Uh, your letter candlers. There you go. Yeah. Uh, tea toddlers. I'm not, I've never even heard of that pro scion. And yet, crumb bums, Bat Medler. Are you not familiar with this term, crumb bum? One of my favorite, favorite insults. Yeah. Um. Yeah, cat hair on my nose. I am very mildly allergic to cats, at least when their hair goes directly up my nose. Um. Crumb bum. Yeah. Wait, noun slang, crumb. Yeah, that's not... Uh... There we go. Yeah. Crumbum. Slang, an objectionable or foolish person. There you go. Crumbum. <laughs> uh... Yeah, you're familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, you know who's not a crumb bum, or a ne'er-do-well, or a rapscallion, is good old Megalosaurus, um, who you will see depicted here. Giant, the most over the top. Not, not so much a crumb bum as a, uh, I guess from the perspective of innocent iguanodon here, Megalosaurus would be more of a... Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh maybe you're a classic villain. You know, scoundrel, perhaps. But crumb bum, I think, implies a certain low down kind of quality. You know, crumb bum is a pejorative, but it's one that denotes kind of a, you know, an objectionably low status. Whereas uh, a mighty creature such as Megalosaurus might be a scoundrel. But it might still enjoy kind of a more lofty status in the grand scheme of things. Am I making any kind of sense here? I hope so. Top scene of dinosaur combat ever committed to no. canvas. This painting, the country of the <laughs> what are we talking all about? Coils and teeth and claws. It's all yeah. rare. At the time, it summed up what experts thought ancient reptiles were like: giant, vicious lizards who hissed and snapped at each other. Yeah. But that was all about to change. Understanding Dinosauria. Anatomist Richard Owen proposed that Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, and another newly discovered animal called Hyliosaurus all yeah. share special physical traits found in their hips and other bones that made them different from all other reptiles. Hence and Dinosauria was born. Came up with a new name for this form of extinct life. There you go. From the yeah. Green, the terrible lizard. But Owen went even. And terrible, not terrible, like lousy, like you know. You know, like, oh, you lousy crumb bum. Terrible as in, it implies a certain loftiness. You know, like, like, Oz the Great and Terrible. It means terrible, like, fearfully great, awesome. On four you know? Occasions he's called yeah. Big fella, isn't he? And Bebuck66, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. The whole reason I'm leaning back right now is I've got a cat on my lap. Um, and sh you keep shifting around, Mini Pie. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, terrible, like, terrific. There you go, Dr. Devasaurus. It is from the same root word. You know, terrible, terrific. It's funny that terrible has a negative connotation today, and terrific has a positive connotation. But both of them have the same kind of root word. You know? Terror, like inspiring awe or terror, you know. 
So yeah. Uh, Ivan is ter uh, Ivan the terrible in English means something different in Russian. Does it? No? Okay, that would make sense. Yeah. It would probably mean like Ivan the Great. And Neon Coffee Cat says, this is why I'm so confused about what is a dinosaur and what is not. Well, Neon Coffee Cat today, oh, I got cat hair all up in my nostrils. Ah. Oh. Uh, today, dinosaurs are, um... There we go. Basically, dinosaurs are everything from here onward. So today, after the discovery of evolution, now that we know that living things change and evolve and give rise to new species, we have a better understanding of, um... You know, why certain creatures are more similar to one another. And it's often because they derive from the same ancestor. So dinosaurs are everything that evolved from this ancestor here. These are all dinosaurs. Right there. I would annotate this, but that would involve getting the sketch pad and the... Anyway, I've got a cat on my lap, so... And we also need to get back to our video here. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, didn't break out into hives. I'm not that allergic, Vigilanta. Only, only mildly so. The more time I spend around cats, the more my body acclimates, you know? So, yeah. Here we go. Understanding Dinosauria. British anatomist Richard Owen proposed that Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, and another newly discovered animal called Hyliosaurus... And, by the way, we need a close-up of this illustration here, because this is one of those classic ones. And, uh... Tedger Hedron, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. Um. Etching. There we go. Megalosaurus versus Iguanodon. So this is an old depiction of these two animals just going at it, you know? Uh, Megalosaurus versus Iguanodon. Now we realize that uh, Megalosaurus and Iguanodon both lived at different times. They never would have met each other. Uh, <coughs> Megalosaurus is from maybe the beginning of the late Jurassic, and Iguanodon is from the early Cretaceous. They were separated by tens of millions of years. Megalosaurus about 160 million years old. Iguanodon, about 130 million years old, something like that. Rough numbers here. But yeah, yeah. And everything is a predator in those days. Yeah, Iguanodon nowadays is... Obviously, we recognize it as an herbivore. Megalosaurus as a carnivore. Um, Iguanodon... Looks like this. That's beautiful. This is the first search result from Gabriele Guetto. This is actually the Belgian Iguanodon. Strictly speaking, we want to look at... Mantellosaurus is actually that Iguanodon. But yeah, Iguanodon looks like this. And, uh, Megalosaurus. Nowadays... Looks like this. So yeah, yeah. Oh, mini pie. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah. We still don't have very much material for Megalosaurus. I mean, here's a neat little graphical representation of that. Uh, the parts that are in white or blue are the pieces that we actually have. Uh, so yeah, we don't... We don't 100% know what this animal looked like. But thankfully, we've got much more complete skeletons of its relatives. And uh, so we can kind of use those to fill in the blanks. Dinosaurs like, for instance, Torvosaurus. Um, Torvosaurus, here we go. Uh, that's a pretty decent depiction of Torvosaurus there. Another good one. Yeah. Uh, other Megalosaurs, like Torvosaurus, have helped us fill in the blanks for what this family of dinosaurs looked like. There's a lovely one from PNSO. Beautiful. Really, really nice. So yeah, yeah. Um, luckily, we've been able to kind of figure out what other dinosaurs from this family 
Uh, thanks to other dinosaurs from this family, we could figure out what Megalosaurus actually looked like. All shared special physical traits found in their hips and other bones that made them different from all other reptiles. And in yeah. 1882, he came up with a new name for this form of extinct life, dinosaur, from the mm -hmm. Greek for terrible lizard. But Owen yeah. went even further than that. Dinosaurs weren't just supersized lizards, he said. In many ways, they resembled mammals in their structure and their stance. And Owen hmm. portrayed his vision of dinosaurs not on paper or canvas, but in three dimensions. For England's great exhibition of 1854, Owen worked with an artist, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, to create life-sized versions of dinosaurs and other ancient creatures as yep. he pictured them. The models were so immense that Hawkins even famously held a New Year's banquet inside <laughs> a model of Iguanodon. And when the models were unveiled to the public- And that wasn't really in the model, I think it was inside the mold? Or a sculpture that was made to create a mold to create the final product, but anyway, we're nitpicking here. You know, let's continue. Banquet inside yeah. the model of Iguanodon. And when the models yep. were unveiled to the public, they became the new image of what we thought dinosaurs looked like. These animals were built more like rhinos, carrying their legs under their bodies, but with scaly skin and tail. There's his Megalosaurus right there. This is what he thought Megalosaurus looked like at the time. ...that dragged on the ground behind them. And it was other new insights into dinosaurs' legs that led to the next big shift in how we imagined the animals. Yep. And uh, I think it was Eustreptospondylus was the theropod dinosaur that was found that showed that uh, Megalosaurus walked on two legs. I don't know if we'll finish the rest of this video. And I, we're having a cat attack on our microphone here. Um. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Mini Pie, you got crazy eyes. What do you see, Mini Pie? What do you see? What are you doing? <laughs> uh yeah and will you purr into the microphone she's she's too hopped up right now to purr she's got to be more relaxed if she's gonna purr right now she's overstimulated she's got crazy eyes you know yeah oh oh, 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 oh many okay she's settling down good um but yeah yeah let's uh Oh, that tail, it's whipping around. What are you doing? What's up with you? The tail is metronoming back and forth. High tempo. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we've got some... Let's see. Take a look at this. Here's a video from Tom Scott on YouTube. Some of you have probably seen him before. Very, very well-known uh, YouTuber, uh, as the kids say. And uh, here he is talking about the Crystal Palace dinosaurs here. Megalosaurus among them. I don't know if we'll actually see the Megalosaurus here, but uh, yeah. I'm in Crystal Palace Park in South London, and there are dinosaurs. Yeah. Dinosaurs, anyway, and inaccurate models at that. But that's because they're more than 150 years old. These were the first ever life-size models of extinct creatures built yep. the gardens of the enormous Crystal Palace that used to stand on top of a hill over there. Yep. So this has been called the world's first theme park. And, uh, yeah, this is also really the first time that, that there was a an introduction of dinosaurs to the general public. These, these creatures here are not dinosaurs. These are crocodiles. These are teleosaurus. Um... But yeah, yeah, at Crystal Palace Park, outside of London and Sydenham, Sydenham Park. They were made by the wonderfully named Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. We now know. Oh, and Pro Sciences, what happened to the Crystal Palace Palace? It burned down in a fire. Um, I don't remember what year it was, but the actual palace itself, which apparently was glorious, it all burned down. Luckily. The dinosaurs and other critters, um, yeah, of the Crystal Palace grounds survive to this very day. Uh, so yeah, we'll be talking about that in a minute, too. They were made by the wonderfully named Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. Yeah. We know that they are utterly wrong in many significant ways, but at the time, <laughs> they were a marvel. Look yep. at what once walked the earth. Yeah. Now, in England, there is a list of buildings that have special protection under the law. Buildings on that list are called listed buildings. Right, right, right. Yeah. List yeah. Of buildings. And this country is full of them. 
Historic England, the not-quite government organisation that manages the list, says there's about half a million buildings on it. Most of those are only Grade 2 listed, which means they've got to be kept mostly intact and any changes need a really good reason behind them. But more than 10,000 places are Grade 1 listed, which means yeah. they're preserved. Pretty much anything that was built more than 200 years ago and is still standing is on the list. Can't but care, there though. are some more modern things, too, including these dinosaurs. Yep, Grade 1. And wow, the Crystal Palace, the actual Crystal Palace itself, burned down in 1936. Holy cow, Jody Fish. That served way, way later than I thought. I was going to say like the 1870s, 1880s is when it burned. Apparently not. Um, very cool. Uh, yeah. Listed, dinosaurs. Can't be changed, moved, or demolished. Have to be kept in good condition. And yep. it can't be updated to reflect what modern paleontologists now know. Uh uh. Because that would involve changing them and destroying well, not a dinosaur. I mean, but it's not like, oh, we paleontologists are, are just itching to change these. It's not like, you know, I, as a paleontologist, look at the Crystal Palace Park dinosaurs and go, and go, like, these need to be changed right now. I'd, I'd be a little bit more dramatic, but again, I've got a cat on my lap. Hey, Mini Pie. Yeah, and I, I don't want to disturb her. Um. Anyway, yeah. It's not like we're like that. We're not we're not itching for these things to be changed. They are a wonderful reminder of how much dinosaur paleontology has advanced in the past 150, 170 years, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Old man yells at Cloud. There you go, Mayor Space. Yeah, not like that. Not like that. <laughs> but it's fine about what we once thought dinosaurs looked like. Something yeah. that's notable not because of what it represents in itself, but because of the history in the sculptures. There you go. These dinosaurs must, by law, remain inaccurate. Because mm -hmm. the story they tell isn't about prehistoric times. It's about science just 150 years ago. Pretty cool. Yeah, good stuff. If you'd like to watch this video, let me provide a link. Not as if Tom Scott needs the exposure. Holy cow, he is immensely successful. Um, yeah, lovely little video there. Good stuff. Uh, back in the 1950s, uh, many of these models were being restored, and here is a lovely... a lovely little video about that with some uh, excellent narration here. I think we might have to do like that. Um, but let's turn our closed captions on. If you're watching this later on YouTube in the VOD, uh, apologies, you're not gonna hear the audio from this because YouTube will probably freak out and give me, I don't know, it'll, it'll throw a fit about copyright stuff. But uh, if you're watching live, which, hello, everybody watching live right now. I'm so glad you're here. Aditi Yelkar, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. I've never been to London, no. Um, yeah, let's take a look at this. <laughs> Our ancestors who were tiny little shrew-like mammals at the time, but yeah. Yeah. Jody Fish says pre-rodentia micromammals. Jody Fish knows what's up. Yeah, true rodents don't evolve into like the Eocene. So yeah, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> is, that a, is that a Bible joke? <laughs> uh, he's Christian name. Coincidentally enough, he's Adam. Yes, from pre-Adamite times. Antediluvian, one might say. Har har. So this is the Hyliosaurus. Hyliosaurus today we recognize as like a 
Polycanthian Ankylosaur. So Hyliosaurus would look something like this. Uh, that's a pretty decent Hyliosaurus right there. Yeah. Uh, there's a good one too. Beautiful. Described by Gideon Mantell in 1833. Yeah, Hyliosaurus. That's a lovely one. Beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah. Nowadays we recognize it's it's an Ankylosaur, probably a Polycanthian. Uh, yeah, not so much like this. This makes it look more like an iguana, but yeah, yeah. Vigilanta. Danny's British accent. I'm just I'm just imitating the narrator. I I could do multiple, you know, uh accents from the Commonwealth Vigilanta. I'm just imitating this uh this narrator in particular. More Iguanodon. Yep. This is from 1959, by the way. So this is a full 105 years after these were unveiled. Okay. 1854, actually, I think is when they were finished. And that's when the official unveiling was, was in 1854, so that's wrong. But um, there's our Megalosaurus right there, I think, in the background. Here's our Plesiosaurus here, who's going to get a new head. Yeah. <laughs> har, har. Very funny. No, but yeah. Um... Some of these were damaged by German bombing raids in World War II, which is really interesting. It's remarkable that they survived. Um, yeah, really, really cool. Um, really important. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Restoration efforts took place in the 1950s. But in more modern times... Uh, there we go. These models continue to fall into disrepair. They are outdoors, 24-7, 365. And, you know, the London fog and rain and sleet and snow, too, I suppose. It snows in London. Um, also takes its toll. But thankfully, there are good people who care deeply about these statues, including the Megalosaurus. And they even 3D printed a Megalosaurus jaw, like the Megalosaurus jaw that we are 3D printing right now. But theirs is for the model instead. Uh, let's just take a look. This is a lovely video. This makes my heart smile. There's our poor Megalosaurus missing his lower jaw. Yeah. Very cool. The sculptures and landscapes were built here in 1853 and 1854, and they were yep. the first ever reconstructions of extinct animals. The landscape... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, by the way, there's Iguanodon, Iguanodon, Hyliosaurus. I think Megalosaurus is watching them from the shadows over here, if I remember correctly. Reconstructions of extinct animals and by the way before we continue this video if any of you watching right now have children or if you are a child at heart 
I cannot recommend this book highly enough. Uh, this is a picture storybook. You know, I suppose written for children? But man, there is... This is also really intriguing to people of any age. It's called The Dinosaurs of Waterhouse Hawkins. And uh, this is the story of the design and creation of these models. Really extraordinary stuff. The Dinosaurs of Waterhouse Hawkins. Um, yeah, welcome to the Dinosaurs of Waterhouse Hawkins. Not only is it well written, it is just beautifully illustrated. Um, really, really top tier stuff. I, I cannot recommend this highly enough. It is really, really excellent. Uh, by Barbara Curley. With drawings by Brian Selznick. A true dinosaur story in three ages. And uh, here's Queen Victoria and Prince Albert visiting the studio with Waterhouse Hawkins, the sculptor, and Richard Owen, the uh, scientist. Talks about how they were constructed. Talks about the famous New Year's Eve uh, blowout party inside the Iguanodon. The opening of Crystal Palace Park. And then look at this. Just gorgeous illustrations. Of these. It really centers around the, the artist and creator. Uh, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. But the dinosaurs are also another star here. Including our Megalosaurus right there. So yeah. Um, the Dinosaurs of Waterhouse Hawkins. Brilliant book. Uh, really excellent. And shoot, you can get it there. Thank you, Claire Burr. Yeah. Holy cow, you can get a hardcover for like... Holy moly. For less than $5 US on thrift books. Thank you, Claire, for looking that up. How you doing, Claire? It's great to see you. But yeah. Very well-researched book. There's a beautiful section of notes in the back. Like... Really good scholarship, beautiful illustrations, really well-written story, excellent stuff. We've actually read this whole book live on stream for, uh, for New Year's streams in the past. So yeah, it's uh, and Triceratops. Thank you for the book recommendation. You bet, Triceratops. Oh man, you're going to love it. Can't say enough good things about this book. It's wonderful. And Mayor Space's top drawer, I say. Yes, quite. Quite, Mayor of Space. Harumph. <laughs> uh, top hole. Uh, jolly good. And uh, Vigilantis' encouragement to support your local independent bookseller if you have the ability and means to do so. Absolutely, Vigilanta. Uh, I actually was just at an independent bookstore this morning. Yeah. Uh, over in Alameda, California. Went there with Ios and Lordy. They bought some books. I'm on a, you know, more of a budget than they are. Ios works for Twitch. You know, she she makes a bit more money than I do. I I work on Twitch <laughs> as, as a, a starving scientist doing live streams. Ios also does live streams, but she works for Twitch, writing code for them as a Twitch engineer, you know? Twitch staff. So yeah, she uh... Yeah, certainly better compensated than I am. So she can afford to uh... buy more, more books than I can. Uh, anyway, I got cat hair all over my face. Mini Pie, you are you are a menace, my goodness. Mini Pie, you are you are a beast. What a horrid beast. What a horrible beastie. Look at you. Look at you, Minnie Pie. Yeah. Anyway, Ios and Lordy are staying with me for a few days uh, as they get more asbestos installed at their house. I think that's the story. They must love their asbestos. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, they and their cats are staying with me for the next few days. Yeah. Oh, Minnie Pie. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. Good stuff. Ugh. Yeah. 
Cat hair all over my face. It gets stuck in my mustache, my beard. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, I'm mildly allergic to cats, and I'm feeling that right now. But, you know, by the end of the week, I'll be golden. Uh, usually just takes me a while to get reacclimated, uh, and then it stops. Got to get the asbestos to keep those cats warm. Indeed, Jim. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh... Blue quotes The Simpsons every time you mention asbestos. Wait, what was that, Lenina? I don't remember that. Blue and Lenina, what was that? I don't remember that. The asbestos line? Oh, yeah. We want more asbestos. More asbestos. <laughs> Oh, boy, yeah. That's what Ios and Lordy are getting, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> uh anyway yeah uh I, I yeah they're having more asbestos i guess i presume i don't know um but yeah there you go thank you lenina and thank you blue i totally forgot about that that's from what season two of the simpsons two or three it's good stuff and hey mini pie now you make an appearance look right there see the want to say hello to twitch chat there is actually a uh, an emote based on Mini Pie herself. Does anybody is anybody subscribed to Lordy? Can you post the Lordy Yum emote? Cause that is Mini Pie, huh? Is that Mini Pie? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Travel exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Mini Pie. Are you staring into Vigilante's soul? What are you doing there right now? Yeah. Are you are you gonna are you gonna steal their soul? Yeah. Is that how that works? I'm not a cat expert. I don't know. I don't know how cats work. But yeah. Um. Yeah. <laughs> there was. A there was an idea that I heard one time that I thought was really funny. And it was that, um... It's that... This is all a joke, of course. You know, this is a it's a science broadcast. Um, science broadcast here. So I'm not stating this as fact or anything. This is a funny idea that I heard one time. And it was the idea that cats are like, uh... Maybe, like, ancient Egyptians believed that, that cats... Uh were like messengers of the of the dead or something and that like they're basically like receptacles for dead people's souls and so that you could just kind of like if you're dead you can like port into a cat for a while and that's that's why cats sleep so often too is they're kind of like recharging once once one of those souls is left and <laughs> that's why they sleep 18 hours a day and then they kind of come back online and they're like oh yeah just kind of checking things out that's why cats are like we're staring at nothing all the time or like you know they just seem really attuned to things that aren't there is it like yeah yeah anyway i thought that was a funny idea made me laugh um so yeah cats are the guardians of the afterlife to ancient egyptians well there you go dr javasaurus so, uh, maybe cats? Yeah. What do you think, Minnie Pie? What do you think? Is there credence to that idea? She's like, I don't care. I'm just happy to have a warm lap to sit in. Um. But yeah. Yeah, Minnie Pie has a 9 to 5. There you go now, yes. And no, the cat is not mine, Smorphosaurus. No, this is Lordy and Ios' cat. Three of their cats are currently staying with me, along with Lordy and Ios, as they have, you know, more asbestos uh, installed at their place. We demand more asbestos! More asbestos! More asbestos! More asbestos! More asbestos! 
Yeah. They demand more asbestos. So while that new asbestos is being installed in their house and sprayed into the air in aerosolized form, I, I can only assume. Uh, yeah, I'm watching the cats. Cats are staying with me. Uh, is the asbestos install a joke or something? Gargoware. Gargoware, you know how incredibly serious I am about everything Gargoware. Gargoware, would I ever, ever joke about anything on these broadcasts? Heavens no. Never. Oh, you're new. You're not that new, Gargoware. <laughs> I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have a, brat, a black cat named Ginja. Ginja sounds more like an orange cat name, S.V. Harkin, but, you know, maybe that's like, uh... Yeah. You know. Uh, the Simpsons cat, Snowball 2. Snowball 2, famously a black cat. And then one time they showed Snowball, the original Snowball, <laughs> in a picture. And it was also a black cat. So yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Ginger can be a black cat, so can Snowball. And so can Mini Pie and Moon Pie and Sweetie Pie. Three black cats. So anyway. With all of that said, why don't we get back to our video here? Um, yeah, let's get back to our Crystal Palace Park dinosaurs. The landscapes were developed as an experience that people could walk through and understand the science of geology. Yep. And the discoveries of paleontology, of fossils, of animals that were extinct. Way back in the 1850s. A completely new way to see the history of life. I love it, it really was, like, this was groundbreaking at the time. Nobody had ever done anything like this before. It was like, it was kind of like the world's first theme park. It was the world's first, like, outdoor dinosaur walkthrough. It, it was extraordinary, you know? Something completely new in the history of, uh, of art and science. It was just a completely new way yeah. to see the history of life. I love to imagine people coming across them for the first time and seeing these huge creatures and thinking what on earth is this and wanting to know more about it and, and there's there's a line about this in that book actually yeah uh, um let me find that for you because oh man as a dinosaur paleontologist it brings me such joy there we go yeah uh during the opening the grand opening of the Crystal Palace Park and Grounds. Cannons boomed, music swelled, and a choir of 1,000 voices sang. Waterhouse bowed before the Queen, then she and Prince Albert invited the spectators to enjoy the amazing sights. Waterhouse hurried to the lake and waited for the crowd to arrive. First two, then ten, then a dozen more. Gasped, shrieked, laughed, and cried. So this was a dinosaur. This really was the general public's first glimpse into what dinosaurs were like. To, I mean, that's what we used to think they looked like, but extraordinary. This was science communication back in Victorian times. And these models are actually, you know, I know they don't look like much, but they had very paltry fossil material at the time, just handfuls of bones. And nobody had ever found a dinosaur before. They didn't really know what they looked like. So these are their best guesses. And they got a lot of things right. I mean, for one thing, look at how upright the limbs are. Here's our Megalosaurus again. They're not sprawling out to the side like a lizard or an alligator. You know? And holy cow, I do need like a lint roller or something. There's hair going up my nose. Ugh. Mini Pie, you are... Ugh. You, you horrid creature. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> My goodness. Um, uh. um, let's see. Reptile gate, sprawling. 
So yeah, there we go. Um, we don't really need the pillar erect one. But yeah, sprawling gates. So the limbs out to the sides like this. This is how lizards, crocodiles, turtles walk. Like that. Their limbs sprawled out to the sides. Dinosaurs did not walk like that. Their femurs are built in a different way. Um, there we go. That'll... That'll work. A little grainy, but yeah. Sprawling like this or upright. When you're walking upright, you've got a different shape to your femur. The femur head goes in at a right angle like that. And then like that 90 degrees like this. I can't even I can't even do that with my, my wrist. It doesn't bend that far. But it's a 90 degree angle here. Up and to the side. 90 degrees. Up and to the side. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sprawling animals are not like that, you know? So anyway, even back in the day, Victorian scientists were able to figure out that dinosaurs did not have sprawling limbs like modern reptiles. They were something different. They had columnar, upright limbs like that. They, uh... They were something special. That was a remarkable insight back in the day. So yeah, yeah. More cat hair, more cat hair, Bob Machine. Oh no. And Reaper Extras is the Land Before Time TV show is my first experience of what dinosaurs looked like. That's cool, Reaper Extra, yeah. Not not a bad first introduction. But for uh, for the world at large... Um, yeah. It was things like this. This is the Megalosaurus... There we go. You can actually download this and 3D print it if you'd like. I was thinking about doing that before uh, I actually heard back from the good folks at Oxford University. They sent me the STL file for the Megalosaurus jaw. But maybe I'll print this someday. This would be pretty cool, too. Um, anyway, yeah. This is what they thought dinosaurs looked at the time. Look, notice, upright forelimbs and upright hindlimbs. Unlike any other modern reptile. Except for birds, obviously. Although back then they didn't really... They had no clue that birds were a kind of reptile back then. That wouldn't come for a long, long time. Anyway. Yeah. Here. And that's really the intention of them, is to is to spark that imagination, and spark the interest, and, and yep. they still do that now, which is Absolutely. what makes me think they're so great. <laughs> the story is often told that they're inaccurate today. Well, they are inaccurate today, but science oh, yeah. is always like that. They were using the best knowledge of the time, and so they really were the forefront of science. For that, they're remarkable. The reason we founded Friends of Crystal Palace Dinosaurs years ago is we noticed that the sculptures were in bad shape. If you look very closely, you'll see cracks and problems with the structure. We'd already been working with the council and the mayor's office and oh, had two rounds of conservation work already done on a few of the sculptures. And in the meantime, last May, during the lockdown, there was an event that caused part of the most iconic sculpture, the Megalosaur, to collapse. And I don't know if that's the most iconic one. I'd say that the standing iguanodon um, whom I have right here, uh, at least that's the, like, scale model of the scan standing iguanodon. I'd say that one's probably the most iconic, but the megalosaurus, also very iconic. It's definitely up there before Hyliosaurus, at least. And we had to use emergency measures for repairs on this extraordinary sculpture. And, uh, yeah, where's this next, says, uh, Ravelin, and, uh, Smorphosaurus, yes, indeed. Nowadays, we recognize this animal looked completely different. You know? Um, there. Megalosaurus should look much more like, uh, let's see. Mm, come on now. That's not a terrible Megalosaurus there. Yeah, much more like this. You know? Um, that's not a bad one either. Yeah. Uh, I could use some work. Yeah, Megalosaurus. That's a lovely one there. I love the coloration. Megalosaurus. But back at the time... 
with only a handful of bones, with no one having ever seen a dinosaur before, they got a lot of key details exactly right, like the upright limbs, you know? And that's... that's pretty remarkable. Isn't it, Mini Pie? Yeah. So, yeah. Use emergency yeah. measures for repairs on this extraordinary sculpture. There is a huge outpouring of love. Are you... what are you doing? You going after the microphone again? What are you doing, Mini Pie? Oh, lap cat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Love for the sculptures. All these different people from completely different walks of life from all over the world just started sending us funds to help the Megalosaur and to help us do something Aww. about it. Because we'd received this money from the public, this meant that we were able to present match funding to the Cultural Recovery Fund when we made our application in conjunction with Bromley Council. The Cultural hmm. Recovery Fund is allowing us to stabilize the sculpture and ensure that it doesn't get worse. We will make a prosthesis to the make Oof. it look whole again until we get enough funding to actually restore the parts that have broken off. So behind us we've got the uh, new lightweight prosthesis that we've had 3D printed after having the damaged pieces 3D scanned. Very cool that they actually... So this is a wonderful example of how 3D printing can aid not just dinosaur science, but the history of dinosaur paleontology, the, uh, the conservation of important artifacts in the history of dinosaur paleontology. I'm currently printing the lower jaw of a megalosaurus as well, but this is the real fossil here that's being 3D printed, which is pretty cool. So yeah, that is a real beast of a 3D printer. It makes mine look like a, you know, like a little Mickey Mouse. And mine's a minnow compared to this whale shark of a 3D printer here. Really extraordinary. Yeah. Parts that have broken off. So behind us we've got the uh, new lightweight prosthesis that we've had 3D printed after having the damaged piece. Oh, mini pie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> oh, mini pie. Yeah. Um, spared no expense, says Mary Space. Yes, indeed. Holy cow. Pieces, pieces yeah. that we've had 3D printed after having the damaged pieces 3D scanned. Oh. And we're now painting it to yep. match the weathered historic material so that when we fit it to the megalosaur, it'll blend in and not appear as if it's had a, a new part fitted. Very nice. There's some fixing points we've designed into the prosthesis. This, this makes me so happy. Like, I... Kindred spirits here, you know? I'm all about this. People who are this passionate about the history of dinosaur science, the history of art in Victorian England, uh, people who are, who are just dedicated to a cause like this, people who are really, really passionate about, about getting this, you know, doing the best job that they can in... Yeah, I, I, it's hard to put into words, but I, I feel a, a deep connection to anybody who's this passionate or enthusiastic about a topic like this, you know? Um, yeah, for those who appreciate such things, absolutely, Vigilanta, yeah. And if you're watching right now, chances are you are somebody who, you could see the value in this too. You could see how interesting it is, how much it enriches our lives to know about things like this. In, in this, in this, you know, the history of, of paleontology is the history of trying to figure out what life was like millions of years ago, leading up to the present. It's the story of our, of our origins, of the context around our ancestors. I don't know. I, I know I've said this before, but... I think I experienced the same kind of awe and, and reverie as a paleontologist as maybe an astronomer does when she looks up at the night sky 
and looks at all of these thousands of stars that are all sending out light to us from literal light years away. You know, she can ponder the vastness of the universe and how small we are compared to how grand that is. When I hold a fossil, I discover a new element from a dinosaur out in the field, It's a similar sense of smallness that I feel, but it's a wondrous smallness. It's... It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I think that's... That's, that's why fossil scientists do what we do, you know? We are intensely curious about what our own planet was like millions of years ago. Every piece of new information that we find about that is another piece in this grand puzzle. And it's it's such a rush to be able to to participate in that, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Uh and uh Vigilantis is preaching to the converted. See, Vigilanta knows what's up. <laughs> I'll never forget my first archaeological dig, says Vigilanta. Uncovering the hearth and smelling smoke from a thousand years ago. There you go, Vigilanta, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a dinosaur paleontologist, when I dig up dinosaur fossils, these are creatures that lived tens of millions of years ago, but they still lived alongside our ancestors, tiny little shrew-like, mouse-like, vole-like mammals that lived back then. Oh, mammals like you, Mini Pie. Oh, there she goes. Somebody's at the door. She's off to investigate. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so good stuff, good stuff. Um, hang on. I think I oh I got cat hair all over my face. Yeah. But uh, I think Lordy and Ios might be back. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, yeah. And, um... There we go. Uh, Dild of the Dane, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Dild of the Dane. This paleontology is wonderful, so says Dild. We're blessed to have people that worked and work in the field, ultimately in the benefit for us all. I mean, I study religion and the same, get the same awe from reading a Yazidi text. Interesting. There's no denying the greatness of the work of paleontologists. My apologies if I wrote paleo... No, you're great. Deal. Thank you, thank you for your input, and it's great to have you here. I'm glad, glad you appreciate this. It's wonderful to have you. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, just in a broader perspective? I agree, Dild, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. And go wash your hands. Let me go wash my hands real quick. Let's put the video going again and, uh, yeah, talk about preserving this megalosaurus here. Damaged pieces, uh, 3D scanned. Oh, never mind, the bathroom is occupied. And we're now painting it to match the weathered historic material so that when we fit it to the megalosaur, it'll blend in and not appear as if it's had a, a new part fitted. Yeah. There's some fixing points yeah. we've designed into the prosthesis and then we've fabricated a new stainless steel armature which we basically bolt that to the existing armature and then the the upper jaw is actually supported off the lower jaw with some fixings uh, which is really similar to the original construction where it had a basically a block of masonry as a support the idea is we can install this prosthesis and we're not interfering with the the historic fabric at all so everything's completely reversible for in the future when uh, when they come to do further conservation works one of the really nice things about um, being involved in the, in the dinosaurs and being local is that when I can walk past and listen to children teaching their parents about dinosaurs, explaining that actually mummy or daddy, these days we think that this would have feathers or would stand on its hind legs. So it's, it's really lovely to hear members of the public educate each other about them as well. We're work that is really, really cool actually. Um, I don't know, this gets into one of my ideas about why I think children love dinosaurs so much. Why a particular kind of child likes dinosaurs so much. Oh, hey, sweetie pie. Hey, where are you going? We'll hide over there. Okay. 
cat activity here. Um, but yeah, I think a certain kind of kid, and this is the kind of kid I was when I was a kid, really loves dinosaurs in part, not just because they're really, really cool, but I think a lot of kids really... When they're learning about dinosaurs, they're kind of falling in, falling in love with the idea of of learning. You know, they're becoming enamored with the feeling of of learning new things, being able to relay that information to other people. And sometimes that means talking to your parents or grown-ups. You know about dinosaurs knowing something as as a child that idea of knowing something that your parents don't even know any grown up that you encounter in a given day is not going to know a great deal about megalosaurus or about i don't know camarasaurus polacanthus uh shentungasaurus whatever so to to know something about this and have that be real legitimate information I think is tremendously empowering to a child you know if you're a kid and you know so much more about this than any of the grown ups in your life it's a feeling of real power you know that's why I think dinosaurs are so important uh for teaching kids about science. So anyway, yeah. Uh, empowering is the right word, says Dild. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And this is a fossil watch, Prawn. It is indeed, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I appreciate you now. Yeah, I don't know. I have, My cat allergies aren't that bad. It's, it's not the worst. Yeah. Uh, I remember how proud my nephew was, says Dild, knowing the names of dinosaurs and being able to explain them to me, b being an adult. There you go, Dild, yeah, absolutely. That's so important. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Wimpwomp says, even as we grow up, I think finding, uh, yeah, enjoyment in learning new things is so important and empowering as well. Agreed, Wimpwomp, agreed. But I think for a lot of kids, that's their first introduction to actually learning real information and kind of becoming an expert in something, you know? You know a lot of kids kind of go through a dinosaur phase. I know, well, you couldn't call it a phase with me. That was a terminal case. <laughs> and I eventually became a paleontologist. But, uh, no, it's... I think it's tremendously important uh, for kids to be able to learn about dinosaurs because they're kind of, they're learning how to learn. Learn They're learning how to get excited about learning. So yeah, yeah. Anyway. And Prawn says, do you have any clothes from Arcteryx? Prawn. Do I look like I'm made of money? My goodness. <laughs> Arcteryx, that clothing brand. For those of you who are wondering, that's, uh... Yeah. Yeah, here is the... It's, like, really fancy outdoor gear. And it's got Archaeopteryx as its, uh, as its logo there. The Berlin specimen of Archaeopteryx. Who is right over here. On my shelf. I can't afford any of this stuff. I remember one time... I got a gift card to, like, a uh, an outdoor store in, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, Lord, do you want to make an appearance real quick? All right, go for it. Yeah. And holy cow, Nature's Compendium. Thank you for the four months of support. Hey, Wait, here is uh, here's Lordy right here. Or do you want to say hello? Cameron's Cameron's right there. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Hey everybody, it's so nice to see you. I can't wait to uh, to see you guys here in chat. I'll come in. All right, cool. Okay. Have a good one. Welcome back. Yeah, uh, Ios and Lordy are uh, 
They're staying with me while they're getting some new asbestos installed. Right, Lordy? Yeah, she's nodding. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. <laughs> anyway, one time when I was a teacher, I got a very generous gift of a, a gift card in San Francisco to uh, like an outdoor goods store. And I'm like, wow, you know, $50. Holy cow, what can I get with this? And they had a bunch of like Arcteryx stuff there. You know, this brand stuff. And I'm like, well, that's kind of a nice jacket, I guess. Like, it was a jacket like this. Like, wow, huh. All right. Maybe I'll get this. I looked at the price tag. I, <laughs> I looked at the price tag, and I just about... My, my brain almost leaked out of my, my nose and my ears. It was like $900 for a single jacket. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah. Um. Yeah. Holy cow. Um. But, yeah. Yeah. Holy moly. So, yeah. I don't know. I'm somebody who... I, I don't know. I buy military surplus stuff. I don't think I ever spent more than... I don't know. One time I bought a jacket that was like almost, almost $200. But it was like a full-on leather motorcycle jacket. And I'm going to have that thing, you know, for a lifetime. Um, yeah, 900 is something else. Holy cow. Uh, does it do your taxes, says Lenina? Oh, I wish. No. Um, and... Anywho, yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Dill the Dane is echoing this idea about dinosaurs being really empowering to, to kids, learning about stuff. Uh, my nephews were so proud due to it being real information. They could talk about it to adults, often knowing more about it. Uh, than any adults in the family does. It's empowering and makes them proud in terms of sparking their curiosity of science and nature in general. And uh, just think it's a really good valid point you bring up. I'm so glad your experience is the same, Dilda the Dane. And dinosaurs are tremendously important for science education for kids. And uh, yeah, that was, again, echoed here. When I can walk past and listen to children teaching their parents about dinosaurs. I mean, I mean... <laughs> How cool is that, as a kid, to be able to teach your parents about a subject? Man, that is, that's gotta be, uh, not gotta be, I, I know what it's like, because I was that kid, you know? It's tremendously empowering, it really is. Actually, Mummy or Daddy, yeah. these days we think that this would have feathers or would stand on its hind legs, so it's, it's really lovely to hear members of the public educate each other about them as well. We're working yeah. on trying to preserve all the sculptures and ensure that they've got a long future. Another 170 years, if we can sort that out, because their yeah. message is one that is relevant, perhaps even more today than before, because yeah. the understanding of how science works is really critical to living in, in a modern and improving world. That's our beautiful Megalosaurus right there. Of course, very much of its time, now completely wrong. This dinosaur looked completely different from this, as we'll see in the next video. But, uh, yeah, yeah, very cool. This is at Sydenham Park, uh, outside the, you know, used to be the Crystal Palace Park, uh, outside of London, in the UK. Very cool. Really, really neat. Yeah. Historic England. And there is a link for anybody who'd like to watch that video and uh, support that channel in any way. Yeah. And here is our Megalosaurus depiction here. Today we recognize Megalosaurus didn't look anything like this. But, uh, yeah, yeah. And Irish John Games. I almost didn't recognize you there, Irish John Games. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? How's the uh, the game making going? Hope it's great. Yeah. Uh. Good stuff. And hi to you too, Irish John. Uh, you were working on uh, Rise of Piracy, right? Do I have that right? Yeah. There's a uh, 
a new pirates game on the internet. Should check that out from Irish John Games. That's the one. There you go. Irish John. Awesome. Very, very cool. And uh, do you have a release date for it? I, I'm, I don't know anything about this, but feel free to talk about that a little bit. You can give us a plug there, Irish John. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Yeah. And motorcycle stream. I don't have a motorcycle anymore, Vigilante, so no. Yeah. Um, but anyway. And, uh... Whoops, why did it... I just have a silhouette now. What happened? Let's refresh that. There we go. Yeah. Does this dude have feathers and a beak? No. Megalosaurus today... would look a lot more like... this. It may have had feathers, but it looks much more like... You know, kind of a, a typical, what we used to call Carnosaur theropod. Like Allosaurus. Like Eustreptospondylus. Torvosaurus. Kind of more vaguely like Tyrannosaurus, like T Rex. But yeah. Yeah. Megalosaurus. Let me find you a good depiction. Megalosaurus. Uh, that's a pretty good one right there. I like the beefy forelimbs with the big claws. Kind of similar to Torvosaurus. Another Megalosaur. Um, that's a pretty decent one right there, too. That's Torvosaurus, though. But anyway, kind of like this. Yeah. So good stuff. And there's Lordy there in chat. How are you doing, Lordy? Welcome, welcome. It's good to see you. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. Megalosaurus. That's a beautiful Megalosaurus chowing down on a dead Ichthyosaur. <laughs> Sorry, Ichthyosaur. But yeah. Yeah. Uh... Anyway, good stuff. Good stuff. So, yeah. Speaking of this critter, let's check on our 3D print. Ooh, we're starting to see... Maybe the evidence of some teeth coming up there. Beautiful. For those of you who just tuned in, we are printing... The lectotype of Megalosaurus. The distal end of the denary. And, uh, yeah, here, let's, uh, let's pull up that video right here. Uh, this is from a program, a program, you could even say, called Dinosaur Britain, uh, which I think was from ITV. I am, of course, broadcasting this in the interest of of outreach and education here for educational purposes. Falls under fair use. I I hope I don't get flat like YouTube doesn't cut this segment out. It might. But uh I don't know. Let's have some perhaps misplaced faith that it won't. Check this out. This is really, really lovely. And there's a uh a vertebrate paleontologist who shows up in this, Dean Lomax. He's gonna show us some of the lectotype specimens of uh Megalosaurus. It's good stuff. Yeah. Britain was once home to over 50 different species of dinosaur. Yes, indeed. These prehistoric animals existed on Earth 850 times longer than modern human beings. A mind-boggling 165 million years. Holy cow. Or 170, depending on how you count it. When I sing the Dinosaur March song, we usually say 170 million years, but, you know... Who's counting? Neon Coffee Cat says Lectotype. I will talk about that in a little while, but Electotype is kind of like a new holotype. But yeah. Yeah. There were three ages of dinosaur. Triassic. Jurassic. Yep. And Cretaceous. And this is almost kind of misleading because these are not the same length. Um, let me show you that real quick. Uh, let's see. There we go. The International Chronostratigraphic Chart. Let's switch to linear time. Here's the Cenozoic Age. Cenozoic Era. The Age of Mammals. We're at the very top up here. Um, a full zero million years ago. 
and we go back to, in blue, the Mesozoic Era. This is the Age of the Dinosaurs. Uh, look how much longer it is than the Age of Mammals. Anyway. 66 million years ago is uh, the very end of the Age of Dinosaurs, end of the Cretaceous period. You've got the Cretaceous. Just this one period isn't longer than the entire Cenozoic Era. And then the Jurassic. So Megalosaurus... I think lived about... I want to say it's Oxfordian in age, actually. The beginning part of the Upper Jurassic? Uh, yeah, about 160 million years ago. Anyway, and then the Triassic. Dinosaurs first evolve probably about here in the Anisian or the Ladinian uh, in the Middle Triassic. It's kind of funny because the Middle Triassic is not even... It's not actually in the middle. The upper is just really long. Anyway, take a look at that. There's a link there that Lenina just posted if you'd like to uh, to use this resource. The International Chronostratigraphic Chart. It's good stuff. Anytime I'm talking about ages and millions of years, feel free to refer back to this chart and see how long ago that was. See where it falls. With all these different names. But yeah, Megalosaurus is from the beginning of the Upper Jurassic. Yeah. And Dild, yeah, sh go ahead and ask a question. That's what I'm here for, you know? Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. And Jim says, is that full scale? This, whoops, right here, the Megalosaurus jaw? It is, I couldn't quite print it full scale. It is 96% of the full size. I had to scale it down 4% to get it to fit on the printer. But yeah, so it's almost full scale. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Procyon. Procyon, it is linear time. I, I always click that. Yeah, it's linear here. It'll show everything proportional to how long it actually was if you click linear. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if it when you first load the page, it doesn't have it scaled like this, so it, I just reloaded it. There you go. So you might think the Cenozoic is as long as the Mesozoic, but if we click linear time, bow that changes things. It actually puts it into proportion. Oh yeah, yeah. So anyway, good stuff. Good stuff. No shame, no sign of disgrace or failure. In fact, in a world full of changing environments and occasional catastrophe, all species eventually become extinct. It's true. Become extinct, like that alert did before its time. What it do? Thank you for the seven months of support. Really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Um, excellent. Yeah. And uh, Cloud26 Pillion says, it's crazy that all, this dinos all these dinosaurs lived in different time periods. I wonder what the future looks like. Yeah, Cloud, that's a great question. Yeah. There was an old, like, speculative evolution documentary called The Future is Wild that you might want to check out if you're interested in this kind of thing. Um, I remember being kind of nuts. Uh, let's find a trailer for that. Uh, is this it here? Let's see... Yeah, kind of, kind of nuts. Yeah. I remember seeing this on TV when I was a kid, and it's supposed to be kind of in the same vein as, like, Walking with Dinosaurs or something, but it's entirely speculative. It's like, what might creatures look like in the future? Um, none of this stuff is going to come to pass, but it was all, uh, they kind of provide reasoning for everything in a way that I think is really interesting. But yeah, none of this is going to come to pass because who knows what the future holds. But, uh... I don't remember any of these. I remember the giant turtle things. Uh, we might have, you know, giant ground-running birds, predatory birds again someday. We had those in the past. 
forest rakids and uh, critters like Diatrima, aka Gastornis. Anyway, so you should check that out. The future is wild if you're interested in that kind of thing. There, uh, uh, Cloud. It's great to have you here, by the way. Welcome to Paleontologizing. So yeah, Squibbins were so good. Oh, we've got fans of this in chat. Holy cow! Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. And Furbly says the future is wild was an awesome documentary back when they were still making good TV shows. Yeah, back when Discovery Channel still had science on it. Agreed. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, let's get back to our video here. Yeah, it is pretty crazy to think about that the age of the dinosaurs lasted over 165 million years. There is actually... You know, I, I know it's cliche. Let me actually reframe the cliche a little bit. Um... Usually it's T-Rex and S. Steenops. Tyrannosaurus and Stegosaurus. But let's do, um... Uh, let's see. Here we go. I've searched for this before. Yeah. Here we go. These two dinosaurs. Ceratosaurus. And Triceratops. They're fighting in this movie. This is one million years BC. And there's people watching them, which is really funny. Here's the thing. People obviously did not live alongside non-avian dinosaurs like this. These dinosaurs lived tens of millions of years before the first people. But, so yeah, they should not be here, obviously. But, there is actually more time separating Triceratops from Ceratosaurus than there is separating them from people. So these two dinosaurs, Ceratosaurus from the late Jurassic period, Triceratops from the very late Cretaceous period, very end of the Cretaceous, there's a solid like 80 million years separating these two dinosaurs. They never would have met in life. There's only 66 million years separating Triceratops from us today. So Triceratops is closer in time to you, viewers and chatters, than it is to Ceratosaurus. Can you believe that? Holy cow. Yeah. So, pretty neat. Pretty neat. Uh, not even Raquel Welch. Exactly, Kennedy. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, did Ladane, let me take a look at your, uh, your question there. Uh, haplo groups, try to make it TLDR. Uh, Scandinavian people migrated there. Yep. Uh, would there have been dinosaurs in what was now present-day Scandinavia, the Nordic Peninsula? Yeah, but that would have been tens of millions of years before. There's, we've got some very limited numbers, very limited material of, of dinosaurs from Scandinavia. I want to say we've got some stuff from Sweden and Norway, I think. Yeah... Uh, but yeah, back then, Europe looked completely different, you know? The continents move around a lot, Dild. So yeah, yeah. Um, dinosaurs of Scandinavia. I think we might have a few nowadays, but it's like scraps of Iguanodon or something like that. Um, yeah. There we go. From both Norway and Sweden, we have Iguanodon fossils. Iguanodon was the second dinosaur to be named and was originally one of three groupings. Anyway, it's one of the first three dinosaurs to be named. This is probably translated from Norse or Swedish or something. But anyway, um, yeah, along with Megalosaurus, whom we're talking about today. Megalosaurus, not from Scandinavia, nor is Hyliosaurus, but Iguanodon... Scraps of Iguanodon have been found uh, in uh, in Scandinavia. Again, Iguanodon, this remarkable critter. Uh, really, really beautiful dinosaur. Super well-known from England and from Belgium. Here's the Belgian one here. 
surely one of the most but yeah animals that have ever existed and certainly one of the most famous <laughs> is a dinosaur thank you prawn for the for the two months appreciate you prawn thank you thank you anyway iguanodon really cool critter you know big old ornithischian dinosaur about the size of an elephant when full grown yeah yeah and uh deal let's see born holemnus that doesn't sound like a dinosaur but let's let's see uh it's a dromaeosaurid really what's it based on uh oh yeah okay dromaeosauroides I think that's what it's based on. It's like a single scrap of a bone. A holotype tooth. Yeah. So that's a really worn down tooth. But anyway. So apparently we've got a... A very worn tooth of a dromaeosaur. From uh, Denmark and also possibly England. Dromaeosauroides. That means like dromaeosaur form. So this is a similar dinosaur to like Deinonychus, Utahraptor, or Velociraptor. If it's identified correctly. Yeah. A uh, few dinosaur remains have been found in Scandinavia. Anyway, read this article if you'd like to learn more about Scandinavian dinosaurs, for sure. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, but, Dild, great to have you here. And you must be from Denmark yourself, right? Dild the Dane? Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, anyway, I am currently broadcasting to you the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. Gotta use this scene at least once a broadcast, you know. So yeah, greetings from the beautiful sunny San Francisco Bay Area. But yeah, yeah. Let's get back to Megalosaurus. Originally discovered in England. So yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's continue. Uh-oh. But incredibly, just 200 years ago, no one even knew that dinosaurs once roamed the Earth. Let's hope she's got roadside assistance. Those things break down. Ugh, jeeps. I'm on my way to see where the very first bone in the world to be identified as a dinosaur was discovered. Ah, uh, what bone could that be? From which dinosaur? It was found right here in Britain. You already know. Megalosaurus. Oxford in a <laughs> oh, boy. See, so, as a kid growing up, and looking at all these different dinosaur books, you know, this silhouette right here, I would instantly recognize this anywhere. I, I realize this is a line drawing, but fill this in. And this silhouette, man, holy cow. I would recognize that anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. Grab this, this book right here because I'll show you an illustration in there in a minute. But yeah, good stuff. A village called Stonesfield. Forty feet underground. Hey, Zoop, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. So this was found down in a mine. So England is not very really well known for having a lot of exposed rock on the surface. Um, you know, you go to places like Utah or Montana or the Dakotas for this kind of thing. Yeah, badlands like this. You don't have a lot of badlands in England. There's too many trees, there's too much grass. You also have bogs and meadows and parking lots and buildings. Yeah. England isn't really, you know, a desert, you know? Deserts are usually the best places to find fossils like this because you've got a lot of exposed rock. You can just walk around and pick stuff up off of the ground. We usually don't go dig random holes to find fossils. We let erosion do the digging for us, and we find stuff eroding out from the surface. But sometimes you get really, really lucky, 
And this is where the first dinosaur fossils were actually discovered were in a mine in England. The first ones to actually be scientifically studied in Victorian times and then later, you know, named as dinosaurs. And welcome, Zoop. This is called, excuse me, Dinosaur Britain here. I will give you a link. There we go. There it is in the chat for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, have they ever found underwater dinosaur, Zoop? Uh, the only real underwater dinosaurs that we have are critters like, uh, like this. Um. Hesperornithids might be a good example. This is an ancient bird. Diving bird. Hesperornis. This is a diving bird from the age of dinosaurs. Birds themselves are living dinosaurs. Here's one being pursued, two of them, being pursued by a polycotylid plesiosaur. So here's the funny thing. Those two critters there, the two birds, those are dinosaurs. The critter on the left, left rather, not a dinosaur. That's an ancient reptile. Uh... show you uh there you go so these critters here not a single one of these is a dinosaur dinosaurs are a very particular group of reptiles they're like one branch on the reptile family tree none of these are dinosaurs that's an ichthyosaur that's a marine crocodile right there mosasaurs like this are marine lizards uh there's, I don't know what that critter is. Another ichthyosaur, short-necked plesiosaur, long-necked plesiosaur. There's a placodont right there. Um, none of these critters are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, almost as a rule, lived on land. These creatures are all just a grab bag of different kinds of reptiles, none of which are dinosaurs. However... Uh, good old Hesperornis right here is a bird. Birds literally are dinosaurs. Birds evolved from two-legged, meat-eating, feathered dinosaurs. Kind of similar to, like, Velociraptor. So this is a dinosaur. These are not dinosaurs. That's pretty wild, right? But again, don't just take it from me. Ask any paleontologist. They'll tell you the same thing, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh... And, the, yeah, the marine crocodiles, they're pretty cool, field. They really are. Um, critters like, uh, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, Matriarhynchus. Yeah. I'm sure I spelled that wrong. There's probably an H in there. Yeah, Matriarhynchus. Anyway, marine crocodiles. These are crocodiles that ended up taking to the sea. And hey, me, give me just a minute. There we go. Yeah. There's a few times when, uh, like, groups of land animals go back into the water. And they, uh, like, whales did this. Crocodiles did this at one point. A certain group of, uh, of crocodiles branched off and they went back into the sea. And they lost their armored scutes. They became more streamlined. They developed these fish-like flukes on their tails. Really cool stuff. Yeah. No, so anyway. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Yeah. Bird from the Faroe Islands. You're probably thinking of cormorants. Uh, Dild the Dane. Cormorants, maybe? Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Great to have you here, Zoop. Great to have you here, Dild the Dane. Let's uh, let's get back to our discussion of English dinosaurs, including our Megalosaurus here. There's our jaw continuing to materialize. Oh, this makes me so excited. So happy about this. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about why this is so special right here. There we go. Just north of Oxford in a village called Stonesfield. Yeah. 40 feet underground. Ho 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 ho. Yeah. It 
It's incredible to think that something found down an old slate mine like this one would change our understanding of life on Earth forever. And, uh... Birds that on says, if anyone is interested in football slash soccer here, Liverpool Football Club's Liver Liverbird is based off a cormorant. Really, birds are dead on? You know, that reminds me. There's a brief diversion here. Um, Let's see. that um let me find this real quick yeah from uh monty python's the meaning of life yeah whoop hang on a minute there we go have been found rubbing linseed oil into the school cormorant. Cormorant. <laughs> Some of you may feel that the cormorant does not play an important part in the life of the school, but I would remind you that it was presented to us by the corporation of the town of Sudbury to commemorate Empire Day when we try to remember the names of all those from the Sudbury area who so gallantly gave their lives to keep China British. <laughs> So from now on, the cormorant is strictly out of bounds. Oh, and Jenkins, apparently your mother died this morning. Captain? Oh, poor Jenkins. <laughs> oh, Lord, uh, 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 it's so good. I'd show you more of this, but YouTube would freak out. Anyway, yeah. Uh, that's so good. Yeah. The school cormorant. Anyway. Back to where we were here. Uh, going underground in search of the, uh, the discovery place of Megalosaurus. It's incredible to think that something found down an old slate mine like this one would change our understanding of life on Earth forever. Hmm. That's exactly what happened with Megalosaurus, though. Yeah. Oh. Again, really tight down there. this is where you gotta go to find dinosaurs in England. <laughs> anyway. So, she's climbing around down there. Piece of ancient bone. Yep. And there we go. A large jaw because it was filled with vicious looking teeth, but it was unlike anything that had ever been seen before anywhere on earth. <laughs> so did I mention that the whole premise of this show is that you know, I forget the presenter's name, but she goes around England and she visits different fossil sites, different fossil museums and stuff. And then, I guess, to try and make things more sensationalistic or interesting for the viewing public, the, the producers of the show, like, throw in CGI dinosaurs running around wreaking havoc that she encounters when she's talking about these animals. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Time to go. Oh, no. Yeah. Next. I come face to face with the prehistoric owner of the mysterious jawbone. See what I was telling you? Yeah. The mighty meaty Meg Megalosaurus. The very first dinosaur yeah. discovered anywhere in the world. Uh, not first dinosaur to be discovered. I mean, surely people have been digging up dinosaur fossils and pondering over them since people first learned how to dig, you know? Uh, for literally thousands of years. But nobody had really, like pondered these in a scientific way and recorded it for posterity and you know so of course the first discoveries would happen in Victorian England the birthplace of vertebrate paleontology you could say you know sort of I don't know France might also 
vie for that title. So might Germany and Italy and some other places. But anyway, first dinosaurs to be scientifically described came out of England. Yeah. Commercial break. <laughs> uh. My fascination with dinosaurs began in my infant class at primary school, and my love huh. of wildlife has grown since then. But I think because dinosaurs capture all our imaginations, it's easy to forget that they were once living, real animals. Yeah, absolutely. I want to uncover the hidden stories of Britain's dinosaur past. How they lived, how they fought. This is a lovely little documentary here. I like this a lot. It's, I think it's really cool that they feature, the you know, real paleontologists too. To identified as a dinosaur was discovered right here in Britain. Yeah. Jawbone containing ferocious teeth. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. And uh, let's take a look at ours. Can we see the teeth yet? Ooh, there's the beginning of one of the teeth you can see there. Ooh, very nice. Um, again, printing this for non-commercial purposes. Uh, for the purposes of science education and outreach. Same reason we're watching this right here. Yeah. Yeah. It was dug out of a mine 200 years ago. Yeah. It was moved to Oxford, where it still is today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, hang on a second. Let me catch up to chat real quick. Uh, let's see. Angry Finches. Yes, Bridge with that on. And, uh, and, oh, Cadmos, thank you for, uh, for your question there. Thank you, Lenina, for reposting that. Which, if any, sauropods or theropods is not avian in accurate art, but would be more reptilian? Curious. I mean, well, that's the thing, is that, well... I have to have a discussion about what those terms mean, Cadmos. Because only birds are avian. That's why they're birds, you know? When we as scientists are, are discussing living things, or long dead things, in the case of non-avian dinosaurs, it's all based on their ancestry, you know? When we say that dogs are related to wolves, we're not just saying, oh yeah, those critters look kind of similar. We mean that they're actually related in the same way that you're related to your parents or your grandparents or your siblings, you know, or your cousins. You and your cousins are related to each other because you share a common ancestor, you know? You've got the same grandparents as your cousins. You share a common ancestor. Dogs, domestic dogs and modern wolves share a common ancestor. You know, dogs evolved from a wolf. And so the wolves that you see running around outside, you know, in Yellowstone National Park today, those wolves and your dog sitting at home right now share an ancestor. And in the same way, sauropod dinosaurs. Here, let me show you. Um, dinosaur phylogeny. Here we go. We'll take a look at this. That's a lovely one there. Yeah. Make this a little bit smaller. Uh, and let's annotate this. Here we go. Grab my drop pad. Oh. Annotation software's having a hiccup. There we go. That's working. There. Good. Testing, testing. It's working. So the reason that we call dinosaurs dinosaurs is because... As far as we can tell, they all stem from a common ancestor. That's why dinosaurs are a thing, is because they all evolved from this ancestor here. So all of these critters we call dinosaurs, including Aves, the birds. You know, we can trace their ancestry back to the very beginnings of Dinosauria right there. So birds literally are dinosaurs. And dinosaurs are reptiles. So, like, you know, yeah. Wait, ugh, hang on. I was looking in the wrong area for that. Reptiles. So, these are all dinosaurs here, but dinosaurs are part of Reptilia as a larger group, if that makes sense. 
So that means birds are also part of Reptilia as a larger group. So yeah, yeah. If you're asking about which dinosaurs had feathers, and which dinosaurs only had scales, well, we're still kind of figuring that out. But I can circle, we know these guys had feathers, and these guys, and of course birds have feathers. Um, we also know that some of the Ornithischian dinosaurs, so like starting about here, you know, these critters also had feathers. And so given that these guys had feathers and these guys had feathers, it might be that all dinosaurs ancestrally had feathers. And some of them later lost those. In evolution, sometimes we see different creatures evolving structures and then losing them, you know? Like how whales used to have legs, for instance. And we've got direct evidence in the fossils. We've got whales with legs from, say, the Eocene period. Or Eocene epoch in the Age of Mammals. Sometimes you lose features through evolution. And so certain dinosaurs, like uh, the ones who may have lost feathers secondarily, might be like these guys may have lost feathers. The sauropods may have lost their feathers. Yeah, but we're not sure. The thing is, we don't have any, like, super beautifully preserved hatchling dinosaurs. Um, that show, like, skin texture and stuff. Not to my knowledge, anyway. So it could be that maybe even baby sauropods or baby ceratopsians or pachycephalosaurs, maybe they had feathers. Simple feathers for insulation. Because feathers might actually be ancestral to all of Dinosauria. So yeah, yeah. Anyway. And snakes, yeah, snakes lost their legs. There you go, Zoop. Absolutely. So yeah, I hope, I hope that makes sense, Cosmos. Um, yeah. Yeah, let me scroll up and, and check on chat. Uh, make sure that... I don't mess with anything. Uh, turn off our annotation. There we go. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, here we go. Um, let's see. Which, if any, sauropods or theropods is not avian in accurate art, but would be more reptilian? If you mean by more reptilian that they didn't have feathers... We're still kind of figuring that out, you know? could be that all dinosaurs had feathers when they were hatchlings, and later they lost those because they got too big, and they didn't need to uh, retain heat anymore. It, we're really still kind of figuring that out, you know? We don't know yet. Yeah. Um, and I've never seen Kunk on Earth. I've heard very good things about that, Dild the Dane. It's an, a new show, right? I heard it compared favorably to 30 Rock, which made my ears perk up. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, scrolling down, scrolling down. That's so cool. Thank you, Amelia Bedelia. Yeah. Where Ducky says the CGI dinosaur skits might be a bit silly, but I can see how they are bringing them to life to capture the imagination. I like that, Where Ducky. I do. We'll see that in a minute. Yeah. And Zoop. Type in exclamation mark mythology, Zoop. Somebody type in exclamation mark mythology, because there's an, an interesting series of books about how ancient peoples may have interpreted fossils. But, yeah. Oh, and Kadmo says, I'm talking about which, if any, dinosaurs didn't evolve into birds. Oh, uh, Kadmo, Kadmos, only, only one very tiny lineage of dinosaurs evolved into birds. Yeah. So, here. Going back to this right here. This is the only group of dinosaurs out of this whole tree that evolved into birds. That's how evolution works, is that, yeah, all the rest of these dinosaurs went extinct. Only one group evolved into birds. And today we call those birds, aves. So it would be, um, yeah, it would be critters like maybe Archaeopteryx and its descendants. We're still not sure if, uh, if Archaeopteryx really was the first bird. It probably wasn't. But there's a lovely recreation of Archaeopteryx right there. I love this so much. It's really good. So yeah. None of the... All the dinosaurs went extinct except for one little lineage. Like, there was one species that gave rise to all of the birds. All the rest of the dinosaurs died out. So yeah. Does that make sense, Cadmus? Yeah... 
And Cadmus says, I ask this because being a creationist, I don't buy the birds evolved from dino bits. Interesting, Cadmus. I would ask you, what evidence do you have to back up your position, I suppose, you know? That's the thing about science, is that, you know, people of all cultures, all nationalities, all backgrounds, all religions, you know, once you're doing science, once you step into the laboratory, you're a scientist. You follow the evidence, you know? If I personally believed that, um... Oh, I don't know. Um... Let's say I believe I belong to some sort of relig religious sect where, uh... You know, I believed that uh, the Earth and the entire universe was created by Betty White. You know? Everyone loves Betty White, you know? Yeah. And uh, she... Uh, she created the entire universe and, you know, the Earth and everything else out of a... You know, out of a container of instant coffee. You know? And I had, like, a holy book that... You know, that declared this to be true. I can believe that with all my heart and everything. I can evangelize that to other people. Sure, but once I step into the laboratory, if, you know, I, I can't, can't let that influence my science, you know? And I think, unfortunately, that's where, that's what a lot of creationists don't understand about how science works, you know? I, as a paleontologist, as a scientist, I'm here to follow the evidence where it leads, you know? I don't start with my conclusion, like, oh yes, Betty White created the, the universe out of a can of instant coffee. That's why all of us are here, and that's why, you know, she will rise again, too, by the way. You know, she's, she's coming back. You can't start with your conclusion and then try and cherry-pick evidence to try and fit that, you know? You start with observations of the natural world, you form hypotheses, you test them scientifically, and usually your hypotheses turn out not to be true. And as a scientist, you gotta go, well, shoot, I'm gonna humble myself and realize, hey, I don't know everything. These hypotheses don't match. You know, like, the, these findings don't match my hypotheses. You discard those hypotheses. You gotta humble yourself in the face of evidence and go where the evidence leads. And the evidence in this case, overwhelming evidence, is that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs. That's why we've got so many feathered dinosaurs, for instance. You know? Um, yeah. This is... Here, I feel like maybe we should take a brief detour from Megalosaurus and talk a little bit about, uh, about feathered dinosaurs here. Let's see. Uh, feathered dinosaurs. Here we go. Oh, man, this is longer than I thought. But uh, let's try this, I guess, from uh, PBS Eons. This is going to be pretty decent, I think, and it's a lot shorter. The HHMI one is going to be really, really good, but that one's a lot longer. It's like 19 minutes. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cadmos says, I'm trying to be tactful here. Uh, I appreciate you, Cadmos. And I don't mean to be calling you out or anything. Like, look, here, as, as a scientist, this is my passion. This is what I work on. This is what I've, you know, devoted my life to. Digging up fossils, following the evidence where it may lead, and yeah. So, uh, anyway, I'm trying to approach this in good faith. I hope you will, too. And I've not seen this video yet, but let's let's take a look at this real quick and see Today what this is about. Today we're used to seeing feathered dinosaurs flying around and roosting in trees, but few discoveries have so completely transformed our picture of the extinct dinosaurs than yep. the revelation that they had feathers, too. Yeah, there you go. 
Yeah. Some of them did. Over the past 20 years, dinosaurs of all types and sizes have been found with some sort of fluff or even full on plumage. But these fuzzy yeah. creatures have raised a whole batch of. And Mikey likes it. Danny, you should watch the debate that Bill Nye had with Ken Ham. I saw that live when it happened in like 2014, Mikey likes. Yeah. Um, I wasn't there in person, but, you know, I saw it broadcast live. Yeah, it was, uh,. It was pretty aggravating, actually. People like Ken Ham are honestly, and I, I want to say this as tactfully as I can, but they're not operating in good faith, you know? Young Earth creationists like that are starting with their conclusion and trying to kind of, like, sneakily backtrack. Like, oh yeah, you know, the, the Earth was created by God in six days, about 6,000 years ago. That is their starting point. That's their, they're starting with their conclusion. And they're like, trying to like, you know, squish the evidence to try and fit that conclusion. And it really, really doesn't work. You know? Yeah. As a scientist, you know, we start with a fascination with the natural world. We make observations, try and test ideas, and then we kind of follow that where it leads, you know? So yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's let's get back into this real quick. And I actually have to go use the little paleontologist room. I'll be right back. Enjoy this video for the time being. Like exactly what kinds of dinosaurs had feathers? And how do we know for sure? And considering that the likes of T-Rex and Psittacosaurus couldn't fly, then what were their feathers even for? Well, find a perch and get comfortable because I'm here to tell you everything we know about dinosaurs and feathers. It took us a long time to make the connection between dinosaurs and feathers and birds in general. In fact, the first fossil to give us an inkling that dinosaurs had feathers was actually one of the earliest specimens ever found. It was Archaeopteryx, discovered in 1861 from the Solenhofen limestone in Germany, which dates back to the Jurassic period. Archaeopteryx means first wing, and even in the 1800s, experts could immediately identify it as an ancient bird. After all, at the time, birds were the only animals that we knew that had feathers, and this thing definitely had them. But Archaeopteryx had some other features too, ones that were kind of strange for a bird, like a long bony tail, fingers with claws, and tiny teeth, things that you would usually see in reptiles. Those clues suggested that birds must have sprung from the reptilian branch of the tree of life. But no one could agree on what that actually meant. It took decades of study and debate before paleontologists started to see that little Archaeopteryx looked an awful lot like a dinosaur. And it wasn't until 1996, 135 years after Archaeopteryx was first found, that a lucky break confirmed what scientists had begun to suspect. A beautifully preserved, articulated skeleton of a chicken-sized dinosaur was found in China, and along the neck, back and tail of this little dino was a line of fuzz. Paleontologists named this revolutionary discovery Cynoceropteryx. It confirmed that at least some non-avian dinosaurs had feathers and that the history of feathers went back way farther than anyone knew. As it turned out, Cynoceropteryx would be just the first of many finds that would show us that dinosaurs were fluffier, fuzzier, and more ornate than we had ever expected. The fossil record has turned out to be so generous. In fact, the growing menagerie of feathered dinosaurs has offered experts a pretty good outline of how feathers evolve. Dino fluff, which experts technically call protofeathers, probably goes all the way back to the Triassic. But since dinosaurs in different times and places had a variety of feathered types, yeah. paleontologists are able to piece together how feathers went from basic filament structures to ones that allowed flight. For example, yeah. U. tyrannus, a tyrannosaur from China, had little wisps that grew from follicles in its skin. It also represents the largest dinosaur currently known with evidence of dino fuzz. But yep. Anyway, uh, this is all going to be good, and this is more about which dinosaurs had feathers and which didn't. I actually disagree with something that she said earlier. Um, when she talked about Cetacosaurus, where was that? Two size have raised flies. Yeah. Then what were their feathers even? Here we go. The likes of T. Rex and Cetacosaurus couldn't fly. So Cetacosaurus, I don't think that's legit. Um. Yeah, I. Goodness, this is based on one fossil specimen of this like kind of fuzz stuff along the uh, you know the anterior part of its tail. I think that's actually like, uh, anyway, I don't think these are real feathers or anything like that. 
Because we've got literally like hundreds of specimens of this animal from China, and only one of them shows these kind of like bristly structures. I don't think those are feathers. I think it may have died on top of a plant or something like that. There's something else weird going on there. So, I don't know. The whole, like, butt fuzz thing for Cetacosaurus. I was listening to Jim Kirkland talk about this, and... Yeah. But anyway, we've got, like, literally... It's got to be, like, 60 or 70 different species of feathered dinosaurs nowadays. Somebody type in the turkey uh, command? Exclamation mark turkey. We're not going to watch this whole video, because, again... This is getting too late here. But, uh, anyway, thank you, thank you, Lenina. Beautiful. Here's an infographic that I put together uh, in uh, November of 2021, right before American thir Thanksgiving. But whether you're, I don't know, if you're the sort of person who eats birds, uh, whether it's for Thanksgiving dinner, or you, your Thanksgiving turkey, or your Boxing Day budgie, or your Armistice Day ostrich. Um, <laughs> whatever birds people eat. I don't know. I'm not a meat guy. Uh, pay close attention next time to the skeleton of that bird. As you're dining upon its flesh. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm making this weird. But anyway, all of these different characteristics of birds that today make them unique among modern animals... From their S-shaped neck, to the hollowness of their bones, the structure of their wrists and their ankles, the, like, unique orientation of their pelvic bones, even their wishbone, or their feathers. Today, these are features that are unique to birds, but those didn't used to be unique. There are a lot of other animals that had those, and all of them were dinosaurs. Dinosaurs first evolved all of those different features. Here's a skeleton of Velociraptor. It's got a wishbone. It's got hollow bones just like a bird. It's got that same S-shaped neck. And it's got the same backwards orientation of its pubic bone in its hips. It's got the same ankles, the same wrists. These are not coincidences, you know? The fact that Velociraptor had feathers... You know? Uh, and this is, like, indisputable. We've got direct evidence of feathers on these animals. Um, with Velociraptor, since the preservation isn't good enough to actually preserve the feathers themselves, we can look at the quill knobs along its ulna bone. Figure out that these animals had full-on, like, flight feathers coming off of their arms, despite not being able to fly, which is pretty interesting. Too big and heavy to fly. Um, but yeah, yeah. We've got other dinosaurs like uh, Zhen Yuanlong. Uh, did I spell that right? I did. Yeah, good for me. Yeah. We actually have preserved feathers on this animal. Like, full-on feathers, which is pretty cool. Um, this is a close relative of Velociraptor. You know, a member of the same family, Dromaeosauridae. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, um. So yeah, yeah. Cadmos or anybody else watching this, I'm not here to attack your faith. I'm not here to, you know, disparage you or anything. I'm here to talk about fossils. You know, here's what the fossils show us, and you can choose to ignore it if you like. Or you can say, oh, no, I'm not going to believe that. Or, no, I'm not a... You're making this up. Or, it's all lies. Or, scientists or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. You can say that if you want, you know? But I, I hope deep down you realize that, like... Stuff is legit. And... Trying to plug your ears and just go la, la, la... I don't know, that's a choice, you know? And so for for people who think that, like, they're threatened by the idea of feathered dinosaurs, the idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs, they're threatened by the idea that living things change at all. You know, if you have built your faith upon 
this foundation of sand. The idea that, like, oh no, the Earth has to be 6,000 years old, and, you know, anything else is a, a lie or whatever. You know, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure, because reality doesn't agree with that. I want to emphasize, I want to very, very heavily emphasize here that the vast majority of religious people around the world, including the vast, vast majority of people of the Christian faith, have zero problem with evolution or with the earth being as old as it is, you know? I hope, and it, it's like, it's kind of lousy that I have to mention this. But it's true. I guess this is the age that we live in, you know? Where some people are so hostile to the idea of science that... I don't know. Yeah. Whether you're Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox or whatever, you know, there's no reason to be afraid of science. To, to build your faith on that foundation of sand where it can be destroyed by something as simple as like, oh yeah, dinosaurs had feathers, you know? Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, yeah, anywho. Um, and there you go, Dild the Dane. Uh, it says, I mean, you can have faith and still believe in science. I don't think those two concepts are exclusionary necessarily. Absolutely not. Yeah, you're 100% right. There are many, many religious scientists in the world, and there are many, many people of faith who are not afraid of the idea of science. You know? Their faith is strong enough that... Yeah. It's not threatened. <laughs> Bye. The Earth being old, or dinosaurs having feathers, or creatures changing over time. You know, the idea of evolution doesn't make them run for the hills. Because their faith is stronger. If you are... I don't know, I gotta say. If anybody watching is really threatened by this idea, your faith can't be very strong. <laughs> if it can be destroyed by... Or seriously threatened by, like, dinosaurs having feathers. You know? That's all I'm gonna say about that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I probably missed a bunch of stuff in chat right now, and I apologize for that, but I feel like this is important to discuss. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, there you go. Science is not belief based, but I hope you. There you go, Dilf. Dild. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dild of the Dane? Agreed. Yeah. So, Dild there is of the Sikh faith. Absolutely. And ironically, a lot of non-religious people who also don't believe in science. Yeah, Brit. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let me get rid of some of these tabs before I overload my browser here. And uh, let's get back to our video, shall we? On Megalosaurus. Let's check on our Megalosaurus 3D print first of all. And, oh, man, the jaw is really coming together. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. We're talking about Megalosaurus today, Creatrix Brit. The first dinosaur to be scientifically described. And, uh... Was her name Allie? Allie is going to talk to us about it. Here we go. I'm meeting paleontologist and author Dean Lomax. Yeah. ...on British dinosaurs to take a look at this groundbreaking specimen. And this is at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Uh, Megalosaurus. In all the world, there are fewer than 40 full-time dinosaur paleontologists. And holy cow, Executive Storm, thank you. Five gift subs from Executive. Are leading this expedition. I appreciate that more than you know, Executive Storm. Holy cow. That is wonderful. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, Executive. Holy cow, Executive. <laughs> there are now five people who will not have to watch any more ads for the next 30 days, thanks to you. Executive, thanks for supporting science outreach here on Twitch. Seriously, it means a whole lot to me. Um, Just ask this scientist. Uh, he'll tell you that in nature... What... <laughs> Thank you, Godmos, for that follow. <laughs> I'm so glad that you got that alert for your follow, Godmos. That's wonderful. Welcome to the channel. 
And yeah, don't ever trust somebody because they go, Oh, I'm a scientist. Just trust this scientist. As scientists, it's all about the evidence. It's not about who you are, what kind of letters you have behind your name, what university you went to, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, it all comes down to what is the evidence? What does it actually show? You know? So yeah, yeah. That's what I try and demonstrate here on Paleontologizing. That's, that's what we're all about, you know? So yeah, yeah. It's not based on some authority that's been handed down. It's based on what is the evidence, you know? And thank you, Executive Storm. Holy cow. Thank you, thank you, Executive. Gift subs in the channel. Holy cow, Executive Storm. That's why you've got a, a VIP patch there. Holy cow, Executive. Thank you. Now we know the dinosaurs ruled the land longer than any creature before them or since. And Marley's 8 1, thank you for the raid. Welcome, welcome. Marley's, how was your stream? I hope it was really, really good. Welcome to Paleontologizing. And welcome to your raiders. What's shaking, everybody? Great to see you here. And Meat Snacks, thank you for the follow. Great to have you. Let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. Uh, you can probably guess, looking at my office here, I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. Hence, dinosaur paleontologist. And uh, yeah, so I go out and dig up dinosaurs with various museums across the American West. I study dinosaurs, publish on them, and now five days a week, I talk about dinosaurs here on Twitch. Believe it or not, this is my full-time job nowadays. I'm able to make a modest living doing this thanks to wonderful people like Executive Storm and, uh, and Prawn and uh, you know, other supporters. So yeah, yeah, here we are. Marley's, I hope you had a wonderful, wonderful stream. What did you get up to? Tell me about it. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Uh, he makes a living working with the dead. <laughs> I guess so, Godmos, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Alfie Ravinson, how are you doing? Raid indeed. And Alfie, these. Thank you, Executive, for gifting Marley's. Really appreciate that. Wonderful. All of these that you see here are 3D prints. Um, we're actually working on another 3D print right now of a Megalosaurus jaw. You know, it's kind of a cliche almost, but if something is an important, scientifically important dinosaur fossil, then it doesn't belong in some guy's office. You know, where does it belong? It belongs in a museum. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I believe that. You know, that's a value that I hold. Uh, real dinosaur fossils belong in museums where they can be properly cared for, uh, preserved for future generations, preserved for scientific study and enjoyment of the public, enjoy enjoyment by the public. So yeah. Anyway, these are uh, are replicas. I'm still working on my Triceratops here. Got to put some more ribs on it. Got to put the end of the tail on there. Uh, some of the hip bones, too. But, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh. So, yeah. Yeah, anyway. Uh, Marley's great to have you here. Thank you again for, uh, for bringing all your crew. Kadmo says, being that the more familiar version of Gertie the Dinosaur was a Fox release. Kadmos, no, Gertie the Dinosaur, we just, we did a whole stream on Gertie the Dinosaur. Gertie the Dinosaur, I think, existed long before... Fox as a company did. Gertie the Dinosaur is from February of 1914. When was Fox Incorporated? I think it was a long time after that, right? Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, scrolling through chat, trying to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, direct ancestor of of Oedipus. Was Oedipus a real person, Cosmos? Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. From Greek myth. I see what you mean, Cosmos. <laughs> I think it was fictional. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Uh, would Danny stop Disney from getting 20, 20th Century Fox if he could? I'm... I don't know. 
If I were a regulator, would I try and stop a, a monopoly from forming? Yeah, probably. Monopolies aren't good for anybody except for maybe a handful of people who already have too much money. But yeah. Marley says, I did play a bit of Terraria, and there are dinosaur-like basilisks. So I thought I'd radio. Very cool, Marley's. Basilisks like, uh... Like this. Uh, they live in South America. Um, yeah, green basilisk lizard. They're also called Jesus Christ lizards. Because they can run on water. They can't walk on water, but they can run across water. It's pretty cool. Uh... Or I want to say there's also like some sort of a basilisk from like mythology, but um, yeah, basilisk running on water. Um, here we go. Pretty neat. Yep, there you go. Zoom. <laughs> really incredible. Uh, they've got these really long toes. That almost spread out, almost like a snowshoe or something like that. And they can take advantage of the surface tension on the water, and they can actually run across it for a certain distance. It only works for a little ways. They can't, they couldn't, for instance, run across the English Channel. Oh, <laughs> as cool as that would be. But yeah, basilisk, basilisk lizards, really, really amazing, amazing creatures. Uh, very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Neat stuff. Yeah. And, uh... Anyway. Oh, Cadmos says, Some claim that the rhyme seashells, seashells was paleontologically based. Is that true, says Cadmos? It's not based in paleontology. What you're, who you're talking about is Mary Anning. And we'll be talking more about Mary Anning in May. We'll probably do a special stream for her, her birthday. But Mary Anning was an Edwardian era uh, fossil hunter. Um, here we go. Yeah, and uh, universally beloved by paleontologists the world over. Mary Anning grew up in yeah, a very working class family. Her family basically lived hand to mouth for. Uh, know her whole, whole her whole life um but yeah she was uh she never dug up any dinosaur fossils but she discovered things like the first plesiosaur found in england uh some of the best ichthyosaur fossils ever found in england remarkable remarkable person and she did sell things like ammonites uh in order to support her family so yeah but I think the uh, the phrase she sells seashells by the seashore. Uh, let's see. I think that actually existed even before Mary Anning, but the story of Mary Anning may have helped that that tongue twister kind of survive um, beyond its natural lifespan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Blog celebrating Mayor Anning, tell a version of the same story. Victorian fossil hunter. She wasn't Victorian. She lived before Queen Victoria. Fossil hunter Mary Anning was the inspiration for the tongue twister She Sells Seashells. It was originally a song with words by Terry Sullivan, written in 1908. That's not true, I don't think. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It looks like the internet origin story for Seashell Seashells on the Seashore, by or from the Seashore, pretty clear and consistent. It was created in 1908 by Terry Sullivan, which is not true. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's see. The phrase is a piece of folklore, which existed in many versions variants before Sullivan got his hands on it. He transformed it into a song, but it was already a well-known folk saying in 1908. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Anyway, we're getting way into the weeds here. Uh, 
There's no trace of Mary Anning, Lyme Regis, or a last plesiosaurs in the song. The song's recorded in Britain by Wilkie Bard in America. Anyway, I don't know if it actually predates Mary Anning, but... Yeah, man, this is long. Holy cow. I will give you a link to this right here. But yeah, yeah. Mary Anning is sometimes referred to as the mother of paleontology. Which, I think that's a title that she gets because there were very, very few women in the early history of paleontology. And so if anybody's going to be the mother of paleontology, it's going to be Mary Anning. She had an outsized influence on the origins of our field, but she didn't actually get any of that credit when she was alive, really. She died penniless. A bunch of Victorian male scientists basically stole credit for a lot of her work because she was a member of the working class, somebody who lived in poverty. She didn't have any social capital. She didn't have any... Yeah. It's only today that we really recognize how important Mary Anning was. Oh yeah, anyway. Um, but yeah, we're trying to scroll up. Let's see. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's see. Cosmos comic strip by Gertie's creator. You're talking about Windsor McKay? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and female scientists not getting proper credit? Unfortunately, that tracks, yeah, Creatrix Brit. We'll talk all about and that in May. Died, I imagine the mammals would still be small creatures like this living in the nooks and crannies of their world, and we wouldn't be here. There you go, Adam Porter. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. So, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, sorry, What? so what were you asking? I'm trying to track here, Cosmos. Uh, talking about Gertie the Dinosaur and Windsor McKay. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to see where you're going with that. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, and Claire Burr, how are you doing? Lordy, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Let's get back to uh, Megalosaurus here. Uh... This ooh, and we can see some of those teeth starting to emerge here on the 3D printer. Oh, this makes me so happy. The original specimen, you know, this super charismatic specimen here, is now reposited. The Oxford Museum, Oxford University Museum of Natural History, back in England, and uh, yeah, in our documentary here, a little video. Uh, the host is going to go visit and talk to Dean Lomax, vertebrate paleontologist. Dean. Yeah. Hello, nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah, very good to meet you. Where's too. your white yeah. beard? <laughs> You're so much younger than I thought. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people <sighs> say that. A lot of people say that. But I've been working in paleontology now for about eight years. Have you really? Yeah. Wow. So you'll be the man to show me in here. I will. Let's take a look. All right. So <laughs> what's your story then? About 2008, I went out to America. And to fund that trip, I sold my Star Wars collection. It's my first professional uh, dig out there digging up dinosaurs. Good for you. <laughs> that is the thing. For a lot of up-and-coming British dinosaur paleontologists, there's nowhere to really do field work in the UK unless you go to the Isle of Wight. You know? A lot of dinosaur fossils, most of the dinosaur fossils that we have from England were kind of found almost accidentally. There's not a lot of, like, exposed rock in England. You know, you don't have a lot of badlands. You don't have a lot of desert topography. You know, there's a lot of trees in England. There's a lot of grass. There's a lot of concrete and asphalt. And, you know, yeah, you don't have a lot of bare sedimentary rock exposed at the surface. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway. In the English dub of Little Nemo, the first voice of Littlefoot voice Nemo. Interesting, Cadmus. Yeah. And Gertie had a cameo in Little Nemo. I remember something about that. Because, yeah, Windsor McKay also created Little Nemo, who was one of the very first ever cartoon characters. Yeah. Exposed rock in England, the Beatles say hello. <laughs> uh, and holy cow. Living creatures from the dawn of time. What havoc will they wreak? 
wonderful. Howdy, howdy, Sci Ant Streams, Balintz. How did your stream go, Balintz? And Sci Ants Raiders, I hope it was wonderful. If anybody watching me right now, watching before the raid, is not yet following Sci Ant Streams, holy cow, are you missing out? Check out Balint and Lita's stream, Sci Ant Streams. They are systems biologists, molecular biologists. They work on ants, and epigenetics. Probably fruit flies. All molecular biologists work on fruit flies, right? I'm kidding. Flatworms, all kinds of cool stuff, and they do really, really awesome science outreach streams. And uh, if you're not following them, you're missing out. For anybody who's new here, like you there, Yuri, or uh, Kai Hira, or Vicky Sky, welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Let me introduce myself. I'm sure Belint already said. All kinds of wonderful things about me. He makes me blush. Holy cow. My name's Danny. I work on dinosaurs. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old good old fashioned science outreach, you know? Answering people's questions about fossils, going over topics in the news about fossils, doing QA and just trying to have, you know, heart to heart discussions about paleontology. And thank you, Zombie Pony, for the follow. And Vicky Sky, thank you for the follow, you know, too, if I didn't thank you yet. Did you realize that chickens are a lot like little dinosaurs? <laughs> I read a book called The Dinosaur Chicken Conspiracy. Ever seen? Apparently, the poultry farmers don't want us to know anything about it, so they've hushed it up. Thank you for the 13 months, Ember Seen. I really appreciate that. And uh, a pink-haired Christian, thank you for the follow, too. Welcome, welcome. To paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Here, we've got a bunch of cool new people here. Belint, thank you again for your raid. I really appreciate it. I think this might be the perfect time for a little introductory video. Kind of introduce some new folks to the channel. Welcome you in. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our good friend, previously recorded Danny. And he's going to tell you uh, why a paleontologist is here on Twitch in the first place what paleontologizing is all about. So without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, and bring him on. So previously recorded, Danny, it's your time to shine. Take it away. Thanks, present day Danny. You know, people ask me all the time, Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember, particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies and the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary. And Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work at a number of other museums around the American West, helping to prep fossils, design exhibits, and educate visitors. I did a fair bit of eclectic field work in various places, identifying and collecting early Cretaceous dinosaur tracks on the Idaho border, Sphenodontian fossils in the gravelly range of the Rocky Mountains, Cenozoic fishes in western Nevada. But most of my work out in the field was with Dr. Denver Fowler, who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. 
In all, I've worked probably a few hundred sites throughout the late Cretaceous of Montana, in the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, digging up dinosaurs. Lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs. And from time to time, that work has even garnered some media attention. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates. And so it, it should be a new species. And uh, much like my field work, my research focuses on dinosaurs. I'm particularly interested in their behavioral functional morphology. All these bizarre anatomical features that certain dinosaurs had, I want to know what they used them for. Right now, I'm working on a study on spinosaurs. All right, but don't ask me too much about that because it's uh, still a project in the works and I can't give away too much just yet till it's published. But anyway, a couple years ago, I realized that things were definitely headed downhill in Montana. So I packed up and headed back to the West Coast. And I've become kind of fed up with all the bull in academia, so uh, I found myself another job. I am now a teacher in early childhood education. And let me tell you, it's been a natural fit since day one. Now, given that I get to design the curriculum, my students now know more about biology, classification, and the history of life on Earth than most adults do. I've been helping raise a new generation of young scientists. Then, coronavirus hit. In mid-March, when all the schools shut down in San Francisco, I started holding classes over Zoom, and we picked up right where we left off. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see a rare and ancient thing, like Velociraptor's jump, or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids who want to see them, line it up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. I am a paleontologist. I realized that I really enjoy teaching remotely. So back in May, I decided to try streaming on Twitch. And here we are. This is my passion. And now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? I believe that scientists ought to be public servants. Ultimately, it's our job not just to make scientific discoveries, but to teach the public about them. That's exactly what I want to do here. Now, because of COVID-19, this will be my first summer in almost 10 years with no fieldwork. I'm trying to look on the bright side, though. It's not all bad. It, at least I have more time for outreach. I've got plenty of cool stuff to work on. And if you could throw some support my way by subscribing, I'd be incredibly grateful. So anyway, if you are new here, you should be pretty well clued in by now. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're having a good time. Anyway, let's uh, see what present day Danny has cooked up for us. All right, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. Thank you even more to our wonderful friend, Science Streams, wonderful friends at Science Streams, Belint and Lita and baby Ilona now. Thank you. Thank you for that incredible rate. I really appreciate it. And I hope all the new folks are kind of clued in now as to uh, what this is all about. And uh, thank you, thank you, Executive Storm, for those... Three gift subs there, Executive Storm? Oh, baby, a triple! Oh, yeah! Really appreciate that, Executive Storm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, for gifting Pimp Cat and Dame Karen and Real Men Grow Beards. I appreciate that, Executive Storm. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. It really does mean a lot to me. There's 
No way that I would be here on Twitch doing this five days a week if it weren't for donations from good folks like you. So thank you. Thank you for that. I'm deeply grateful. Yeah. Uh, do I still have that red ukulele? It's orange, Wimp Wop. And of course I still have it. Yeah. That's my uke. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh... Is that this? I don't know what that is, Claire Burr. What? Sandlot. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, good stuff. Good stuff. Again, today we are talking about the first dinosaur ever scientifically named Megalosaurus, which was named on this very day. Well, it was first announced before the London. Geological Society on February 20th, 1824, 199 years ago on this very day. Announced by William Buckland. Now, let's travel to England and let's talk about this critter here. Uh, dug out of a... It's first found by quarrymen in a mine, or by miners, I suppose, uh, in a mine in a place called Stonesfield in Kent, I think. Oxford, Oxfordshire. My UK geography is... I've never been to the UK, you know? <laughs> it's, it's certainly lacking. But, uh... Yeah, and Megalosaurus Buckland die. There you go, Dragnet Rocker. Yes, indeed. It's funny, William Buckland named Megalosaurus, and yet its name is Megalosaurus Buckland die. You can't name a critter after yourself. There's rules against that. But he just named the genus Megalosaurus. This is back in the day when, like... Yeah, I don't know. A lot of these things were still kind of being codified. Uh, so I think it was Gideon Mantell who named it Megalosaurus Bucklandi after William Buckland who named Megalosaurus the genus. The species Bucklandi was named by Gideon Mantell, I think. Anyway, you can check the Wikipedia article on Megalosaurus there. And uh, yeah. And 9.5, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing 9.5. What a spiffy partner pad you got there. Oh, uh, welcome, welcome to the channel. It's good to have you here. Yeah. And, uh, let's see. And Real Man says, I've had start on taking a trip to England. I'm already here. Well, that was fast, Real Man. Holy cow. <laughs> Did you know that your country, England, was the birthplace of dinosaur paleontology? And here, at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, the first dinosaur remains to be scientifically described are reposited. You can go there and see the very first dinosaur fossils ever published. Uh, you know, well, you, you can see the original Megalosaurus remains. Pretty cool. So, yeah. And Digital Dak, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Uh, but, yeah... Uh, it's not mine. I borrowed it from chat. No, I understand 9.5. You, you borrowed the partner badge. I like that. Mine also. I only have that because of this wonderful community, and I am deeply indebted to uh, everybody who supported me, so I appreciate you very, very much. Yeah. I mean, let's, uh, let's get into this. And Dragnar Rocker, Prehistoric Planet is... That is excellent. It's really, really good. Um... Man, if Megalosaurus were featured in Prehistoric Planet, you you bet your posterior we'd be watching clips from that on this broadcast, but, you know, for educational purposes, obviously. Anyway, like we're watching this for educational purposes. Here is the host of this show. I think her name is Allie. Uh, here is Dean Lomax, vertebrate paleontologist. He's going to walk her through some Megalosaurus remains here. Let's take a look. Uh, and it, Oh, Ragnarokker. I'm my sorry. Is my first Ragnarokker. Dig out there up Good for anyway, you. appreciate you being here. Sorry I got your name wrong. Thank you for correcting me. In Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. There we go. Back when it was discovered, large fossil... Um, by the way, I can totally relate to this, so I don't want to gloss over this part. I really appreciate that uh, Dean Lomax, like myself, he probably comes from a working class background too. He funded his first field work by, what was, what was he saying, St selling his Star Wars collection? So what's your story then? 
about 2008, I went out to America. And to fund that trip, I sold my Star Wars collection. It's my first professional uh, dig out there digging up dinosaurs. Good for you. I can relate. I was able to sustain myself during my first field work by uh, volunteering for medical experiments. <laughs> I'm not really kidding. Oh. <laughs> It wasn't anything too invasive. I was testing out different, like, uh, hand soaps and stuff like that. A lot of, like, antibacterial hand soaps. There's a place called Bioscience Laboratories in Bozeman, Montana, where I went to school. And I used to go there for extra income. I would volunteer for, uh, for like, bioscience studies like that. So, uh, anyway, it was a lot of testing hand soaps, hand, hand soaps antibacterial soaps. Uh, pre-op scrubs and stuff like that, like pre-operation antibacterial treatments and that kind of thing. You know, a lot of hand washing. Um, you know, they take samples of, you know, like from your skin and then test it for bacteria. And... Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> it's a way that I could make some cash when I was uh, when I was there at Montana State University in college. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you took the place of a poor little animal, this is okay. There you go, Scout. Yeah. It's like animal testing. Uh, it's like the, it's like that meme, you know? Um, uh, yeah. Oh, just don't download it. Shoot. Um, yeah, it's like this, you know? Animal testing. Oh. Testing on me? <laughs> yeah, human testing. There you go, Claire Burr. I got paid for it, you know? So yeah, I did a lot of that. A lot of that. When I lived in Montana. I was one of their favorite, favorite test subjects. That's what they call this, test subjects. Uh, not patients, not clients. Test subjects. Yeah. So, uh, so I sold my body in college. You could say so, real men grow beards. You don't know the half of it, my goodness. Yeah. I never had a reaction, no, Roland, no, no. Um, yeah. And test subject number three, they did have a number for me. I don't remember what it was, though, Claire Burr. Um, but I had, like, a number in their interior records. And, like, I learned it after a while because I'd hear them, like, calling the numbers back and forth. And it's like, once you hear the same number often enough, it's like, oh, yeah, okay. That's that's my number. Shoot. It's like a dog or a cat learning their name, you know? It's like they keep hearing the same thing over again and they go, oh, yeah, okay. They put two and two together. Yeah. So, anywhere. It's me. <laughs> there you go, Clever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So yeah, I did a lot of that. Um, so yeah, I can, again, the whole reason we're talking about this, uh, Dean Lomax, who I don't mean to presume. You never want to presume, you know? What's the old saying? When you presume, you make a prez out of you and me. Uh, but yeah, anyway. Um, what's his story then? About 2008, I went out to America. And to fund that trip, I sold my Star Wars collection. It's my first yeah. little, uh, dig out there digging up dinosaurs. Good for you. The ancient. Yeah, I, I underwent human testing for my <laughs> to fund my fieldwork and stuff. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Jawbone is now housed yeah. at Oxford University. And Vicky Sky, I will see you next time, Vicky Sky. Thank you for the follow and uh, thanks for being here. Appreciate you. Yeah. It's a museum of natural history. And I know it's assume paper cuts. I was making a joke. You know? Yeah. Uh, the ancient jawbone is now housed in Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. There we go. Back when it was discovered, large fossilized bones had already been found in other parts of the world. Yep. But no one had any idea what they were. In China, they gave rise to the myth of dragons. In Britain, they were thought to belong to a race of giants. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Thank you, Amber Seen, for gifting Vicky Sky. Really appreciate that, Amber Seen. Thank you, thank you. And look, holy cow, we're now at 33 out of 40 subs. Seven left until we hit our goal for the day. Oh, boy. And while we're at it, let's check on our 3D print. Oh, man. 
the the teeth are starting to emerge. Take a look at that. Beautiful. You're going to see the real thing. It's a few short moments here. Giant humans. Yeah, here. Hear what they were in other parts of the world, but no one had any idea what they were. Mm. In China, they gave rise to the myth of dragons. In Britain, they were thought to belong to a race of giant humans. Well, Ellie, <laughs> there's one dinosaur. Oh, Ellie, not Ally. I'm sorry. But holy cow, look at that. This is extraordinary. Look at that. And look at this. Yeah. Just beautiful. Um, it's so wonderful that institutions like the Natural History Museum at Oxford University exist to make sure that these fossils are held in the public trust in perpetuity. It's pretty incredible. You know, this was first named back in 1824. That's when it was published on by William Buckland. It is still there in the museum collections. This is what museums are for, you know? When, when I go on and on about, uh, belongs in a museum. this is why that belongs in a museum is that literally like <laughs> 200 years later, it is still there in the museum. That kind of continuity is incredible. You know, this is a piece of the earliest history of dinosaur paleontology and you can still go there and study it. And I, you know, was emailing some folks from the museum and because I saw that they had a beautiful, uh, like, X-ray CT scan of this specimen. And I said that would be wonderful for me to be able to 3D print as, like, a teaching reference. You know, uh, for my science outreach stream that I was doing today. You know, for the 199th anniversary of the announcement of uh, Megalosaurus, here we are. Good folks at the Natural History Museum at Oxford University. They sent me the file. And here we are. It's pretty extraordinary, you know? Yeah. And Real Men Grow Beard says, like many museums in the UK, there is no fee for entry at the museum at Oxford. Very cool. So that's... That makes my heart smile as a scientist and somebody committed the science outreach, you know? You can just walk into that museum and learn all you want. No fee. It's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. I was using the saying about assuming all the time. There you go, Larga. I'm sorry, yeah. The, our auto mod here is sometimes a little zealous. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and technology, indeed, Lordy. <laughs> indeed. Um, very, very cool. Yeah. And uh, Wombat Hole says, the 3D printer is teething. They grow up so fast. Yes, indeed. Ios cry. <laughs> they grow up so fast. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And many museums in Washington are free. Yeah, you know that? That, I think... It's such a, a wonderful public good to have free museums open to the public. It's really extraordinary. Anyway, let's hear uh, let's hear Dean Lomax talk about this a little bit. To um, a race of giant humans. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, if there was one dinosaur specimen to rule them all, and this this is it. That's yeah. Quite so how did they go from thinking that these were giant humans <laughs> to discovering that they were dinosaurs? Well, for one thing, it doesn't look anything like any part of a human being. That's your first clue, you know, is that it's not from a human. <laughs> oh, but yeah. Hello, Reverend William yeah. Buckland. He was a brilliant geologist and paleontologist and very well yeah. respected. He started to study these teeth. Look at now, that. Look closely here, you have this Gorgeous. tooth coming through. Mm. He recognized yeah. this as a replacement tooth. He realized that reptiles continue to replace their teeth. And he thought, well, instantly, mm -hmm. this must be some huge extinct reptile. This was something completely new, an extinct animal which has not been recorded in the Bible. That's controversial for a man of the cloth, then. This must have challenged yeah. quite a lot of ideas for him. 
at the time because of, indeed this was something completely new. And that's really interesting because William Buckland, and his bust you see right here, not only was he a geologist, we didn't come here to but fight with monsters. We came here to find fossils. There you go, Cook and Junior. We did come here to find fossils. Just like William Buckland did. Thank you for the follow. Appreciate you. Um yeah, not only was he a scientist, a geologist, kind of a gentleman scholar, he was also the dean of Christ Church at the time. Uh, or the dean of the Church of Christ? I forget. But anyway, William Buckland, really, really interesting, interesting character. In fact, got a little snippet in here. This is a wonderful book called The Dragon Seekers, about the very early history of European paleontology. Um, Europe was, of course, the birthplace of the science of paleontology, especially the UK. But, uh, and Christchurch is in Kent, if I recall correctly. There you go. Now, that does make a lot of sense. That does make a lot of sense. Let me read you an excerpt of this real quick about William Buckland, this man here who, you know, named Megalosaurus. He first announced Megalosaurus to the London Geological Society on this very day, February 20th. 1824, 199 years ago today. Uh, but this says, uh, William Buckland was larger than life, and his enthusiasm for geology and paleontology must have been self-evident to all who met him. Sir Roderick Murchison, a contemporary geologist, describes visiting him in his rooms in college. Uh, and so Murchison writes, On repairing to Buckland's domicile, I can never forget the scene that awaited me. Having climbed up a narrow staircase, I entered a long corridor-like room, which was filled with rocks, shells, and bones in dire confusion. And in a sort of sanctum at the end was my friend in his black gown, looking like a necromancer, sitting on one rickety chair covered with some fossils and cleaning out a fossil bone from the Matrix. Matrix is the rock that surrounds a fossil. It's a term that we have in paleontology. Uh, Buckland was also the consummate actor and went to great lengths to entertain as well as to enlighten his audience. Now, one of his former students recalls the first Buckland lecture that he ever attended. He paced like a Franciscan freak preacher up and down the long showcase. He had his hand on a huge hyena's skull. He suddenly dashed down the steps, rushed, skull in hand, at the first undergraduate on the front bench and shouted, What rules the world? The youth, terrified, threw himself against the next back seat and answered not a word. He rushed then on me, pointing the hyena skull in my face. What rules the world? Haven't an idea, I said. The stomach, sir, he cried, again mounting the rostrum, rules the world. The great ones eat the less, and the less, the lesser still. He must have been a really fascinating guy. <laughs> I mean, like kind of a larger-than-life personality. Um, yeah, Buckland's eccentric ways and his zeal for the new sciences of geology and paleontology must have caused some consternation among the older dons. Uh, yeah, one venerable fa faculty member commenting on Buckland's recent departure on an extended trip to Europe remarked, Well, Buckland is gone to Italy. So thank God we shall <laughs> so thank God we shall hear no more of this geology. Anyway, these were new sciences at the time, geology and paleontology, and William Buckland was there at the forefront. Having named the, the very first dinosaur ever scientifically described, Megalosaurus, you know, he, he's there at the very beginning. Like the birth of dinosaur science. Pretty cool stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, and very Monsterica, I like that. Monsterica, how are you doing? Welcome back. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Trappy Jenkins says, Danny, what museum should they put your bust in? Oh. I don't know if I... I don't know if I want that trap. <laughs> seems, seems a little self-aggrandizing, but... Uh, I don't know. You know what? No, I'll say, I'll say this, Trappy. What museum... Should they put my bust in? Eventually, long after I'm dead, long after I'm dead, they should put it in the museum that that I established. It is my dream to one day establish a public-facing paleontology museum 
here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Someday, someday I really, I, I dream of accomplishing this. You know, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area, where I was born and raised and where I live now, we, we don't have a paleontology museum, a public-facing one, anywhere in the San Francisco Bay Area. We don't have one in Northern California. Someday. Someday. I want to make that happen. But we'll talk about that later. I don't want to go off on a big tangent about that currently. But yeah. Yeah. Uh... Yeah. Scout says, imagine having your skeleton or mummy displayed in your museum. Super cool. Yeah, imagine a, a taxidermed Danny Antuza. In one of those dioramas where it's like, um... Yeah. Uh... Yeah, something like, uh... Dinosaur excavation diorama? Why is this not... Here, let's search, uh... And thank you, Lordy, for that gift sub. Appreciate you, Lordy. Look. 34 out of 40. We've just got six subs left. Six left to meet our sub goal for the day. Thank you, thank you, Lordy. Get that sub goal? Appreciate you, Lordy. Yeah. Anyway, what am I looking for? This is what I'm looking for, yeah. This is what the how the Wonkle Rex used to be displayed at Museum of the Rockies. Now, actually, in this spot is uh, is Yoshi's trike, a triceratops that I dug up. That's there right now in the same spot at MOR. But back when I first started in Montana, this is what uh, what was there. This is the Wonkle Rex, and this is arranged as the bones were in the ground when they were first found. Someday, long after I'm dead, taxiderm my body. I guess you'd have to do it before I'm long dead. Stick me in a museum like this, hunched over a dinosaur fossil and like a fieldwork diorama. You know, that'd be that'd be a fitting uh, a fitting resting place, right? <laughs> yeah, and sloppy salamander. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 2011. I was on the uh, the Yoshi's Trike crew. Um, here. Uh, Twitter. I'll give you proof. Uh, yeah. Here, Denver posted this a while ago. Denver Fowler, my old crew chief. Come on, Twitter. It's taking forever to load. Um, yeah. I submitted the post cranium of Yoshi's Strike in 2011. And who's this dingus? <laughs> Yeah. That's me. Yeah. Good stuff. Hmm. This diorama shows D and Duza in this natural habitat. There you go, Kennedy. Yeah. So yeah. Uh Sloppy Salamander, you're familiar with with MOR 3027? The Triceratops from the Yoshi's Trike site? Holy cow. Yeah. Uh I look weird without my beard. Ragnaroker. <laughs> I only I used to grow out a beard every summer, but only when I was in the field, you know? So yeah. Yeah. And Cadmos, I agree. Yeah, Weird Al's Jurassic Park video is funny. Agreed, Cadmos. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh but yeah, I was I was certainly younger in the past. Mo most people are younger. When you look at earlier in their lives, Roland. It's <laughs> typically how these things go. I don't have Benjamin Button disease. Oh. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. And, uh. It's on my bucket list of visits. Oh, yeah, definitely go to Museum of the Rockies. Best dinosaur museum in Montana. One of the best dinosaur museums in the world, honestly. So, yeah. And that's named after uh, Yoshi Katsura, who was the paleontologist who first discovered Yoshi's Trike back in 2010. They dug up the skull, or most of the skull, in 2010. In 2011, my first summer in the field, we dug up 
the uh, what was rest of the, the what was left of the skull, and then what was what we could find of the post cranium, all the bones behind the skull. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, I uh, jacket art is a long-standing tradition with Museum of the Rockies, and uh, this was the art that I did on on the jacket here. By the way, a truck horn is a truck horn here right now. Because I do believe a truck horn sent me these, which will be used for jacket art in the field. Uh, so thank you, thank you, truck horn. Yeah. Uh, appreciate you, truck horn. Holy cow. So yeah, yeah. And Zesty Fungi. I think when Denver took this picture, he may have been making a snarky remark and... <laughs> I probably scowled or something. I don't know. Usually I'm pretty smiley in pictures, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Anywho. Yeah. Uh. Good stuff. Good stuff. And you watched a couple of videos from different science communicators. Very cool. Selfie Salamander. Yeah. I was on the crew digging up Yoshi's Strike in 2011. So, anywho. Yeah. And if you want a link to this. So you know I'm not making this up. Uh, here it is right there. Yep. We had Shade Tarp City. There's Alessandro Chiarenza and Mattia Baiano. Two uh, Italian paleontologists. Alessandro is in Italy. Mattia does a lot of work with the Argentinians now. Argentines. And yep, there's me on the crew. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hitting that back wall, as it were back wall of the quarry um there's nick there's nate carroll who's now curator of uh the carter county museum in ecolaca montana there's alessandro chiarenza who's now a you know kind of up and coming pretty well known paleontologist now he's done some really cool papers recently there's mattia baiano who is first author on some new argentine dinosaurs alita bayul who i think was working she might be in china right now Alita, one of Jack Horner's graduate students, and uh, and there's me, yeah. So there we go, yeah, yeah. Uh, good stuff. This is my first summer in the field. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So I was nine years old in that photo. Yeah, Zesty Fondry. Of course, like all Twitch streamers, I'm 21 and single. It was a heck of a summer. It really was. Lava, yeah, yeah. No, it's really cool to be able to, you know, see, like, all of the people that, uh, yeah, that have come through Museum of the Rockies, you know, where I was trained. It's, it's pretty, pretty incredible, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Jimmy Chu says, what's the estimated worth of it? It's not a dollar amount. It's, it's a dinosaur fossil. It's priceless, you know? You can't put a dollar amount on it, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yoshi's trike in particular has gotten a lot of attention. Here's a uh, a plastic model that's based on Yoshi's trike. Denver actually talks about that in the tweet. Oh, sorry. I was going to give you the link to the tweet. Here we go. Um... Let's see, copy link, and a paste. Yeah, a new model of Yoshi's trike, which we excavated in 2010 and 2011. Uh, the horn was so large, we thought it was a femur at first. However, the rest of Yoshi's skull and skeleton is actually not especially big. It is a sub-adult, and not a late sub-adult either. It's not full-grown, and yet it's got the longest horns of any Triceratops ever found. It's going to be a new species once it finally gets described. Uh, once it finally gets published on but uh yeah yeah and in uh denver and john's paper about this yeah here we can basically watch the evolution of uh of triceratops through time uh there we go here's the paper right here What is this? My goodness. Uh, 
Why is, oh, I must have... Uh, anyway, here's the PDF right here. I will give you a link. We've got so many Triceratops specimens nowadays. We've got like a hundred just at Museum of the Rockies alone. We can put them in sequence. You know, if we pay very close attention to where we get them in the rock records. If we record which layers they come from. We can put them all in order and we can basically watch them evolve through time. It's a beautiful example of what we call anagenesis. Like, kind of non-branching evolution. And this one at the bottom we call Triceratops horridus. That's a species that's been known about for a long time. Triceratops prorsus comes from the upper Hell Creek. In the middle, this one doesn't have a name yet. That's Yoshi's trike. And so, yeah. I mean, calling them different species, this is one lineage evolving over time. So, like, it's the same genome. It, it's the same germline, you could say. If you want to use a term that we never use in paleontology. Um, yeah, it's the same critters. So, really, it's just the same species evolving over time. But we've got these kind of neat breaks in the rock record, and so they've traditionally been referred to as different species. Like, we used to think that Triceratops prorsus and Horridus had split at some point. And, like, we've got two species of Triceratops in the Hell Creek. But nope, they actually form part of a continuous line like this. Um, so, yeah. Evolution in action, baby. When you get enough dinosaur fossils, you start to watch it happen. It's pretty cool. So, anyway, Yoshi's trike is going to be somewhere in the middle there. It's intermediate between Horridus and Prorsus, which is pretty cool. I hope it gets published sometime soon. Oh, yeah. And, uh... And Lara Gale... I'm sorry, that's a repost. Shoot, I missed it the first time. Apologize, Lara Gale, but good to see ya. Alright, thank you for... Good to see ya. Thank you for sharing. Used to visit the Museum of Natural History in New York City, the AM&H. The American Museum of Natural History. In New York. Very cool, Lara Gale. At least twice a year in elementary school. You're so lucky, Lara Gale. I didn't get to visit my first dinosaur museum until I was... Oh boy. I think I was a junior in high school. Got to go to the Field Museum in Chicago. Again, because here in the San Francisco Bay Area, as beautiful as the San Francisco Bay Area is, and it is beautiful indeed, we don't have any dinosaur museums here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We've got 9 million people who live in the Bay Area. It's an economy larger than that of Saudi Arabia. You know, it's one of the, like, economic centers of the world. Economic and population centers. We don't, we don't have a dinosaur museum. We, we don't. So, yeah. Yeah, someday. Someday I want to make that happen. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. But anywho. Yeah. And, uh... And Lenina... Yeah, very few museums are dedicated to dinosaurs. Um... But yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of museums that... That you could call dinosaur museums. I would call AM and h They've got whole dinosaur halls. The Field Museum has a massive dinosaur hall. You know, I would call those... Dinosaur museums, even if dinosaur museum is not in the, the name, you know. Yeah. But uh anyway, we don't we don't have a museum anywhere in the Bay Area with a dinosaur hall. We just we just don't. You know? So yeah. Anywho. Uh I don't think you could call the uh the Oxford University Museum of Natural History a dinosaur museum either. Although it does have, I don't know if it has a hall of dinosaurs, but it does have the very first dinosaur fossils ever, like, described in a scientific journal. Um, yeah. Or the first fossils of Megalosaurus, at least. Uh, well, it's got the holotype and lectotype of Megalosaurus. We'll put it that way. Let's continue. In 1824, Buckley yeah. found this find, Megalosaurus, which means yeah. lizard. It's the world's first ever recorded account of a dinosaur. However, the term yep. dinosaur had yet to be invented.
Yep, that would be 1842 when it was first coined by uh, Richard Owen. And KK got it going on, says, I should go to the Natural History Museum in L.A. You absolutely should, KK, yeah. If you live near L.A., you can get in, I think you can get in for free, depending on your zip code. Look it up. See if when you can get in for free. Also, Thursday might be their free admission day. I don't know. Look it up. But it's the, uh, we used to call it LACM, the Los Angeles County Museum. I think now they call themselves NHMLA, Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. I did a live stream from there with, uh, with Lordy back in August of 2021. It was brilliant. So make sure you go there. It's beautiful. California's premier dinosaur museum. Uh, they've got a beautiful hall of dinosaurs at, at the Natural History Museum of LA. Definitely go there if you ever get the chance. Yeah. If I carefully move these around, yeah. you see how big this animal is. It's huge, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, put this huge skull together. Big... Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yowza, that's a big a idea. Gorgeous. This I mean, yeah. that's, that's immense. Pretty fearsome predator. And it's British too. Incredible. And it's British too, yeah, there you go. <laughs> what did Megalosaurus look like? So we now know that Megalosaurus is this big 30 foot long animal, walks on its hind legs, big muscular hind leg, built for yep. running. This was a big predator. And it would have been living in Oxfordshire around about 167 million years ago. 167, okay. An amazing predator. <laughs> this is going to be goofy. So yeah, we've got an actual... You know, vertebrate paleontologist here and a TV presenter. We've got actual Megalosaurus fossils right here. Very, very cool. As if that's not... I don't know. I guess the TV producers thought this wasn't exciting enough. So they had to cook this up. But yeah. And uh, Sloppy Salamander says, I love the format of this documentary, honestly. It's a little goofy, but I it is pretty engaging. You know, I, I try and think about all the people who... You know, they would maybe not sit down and watch a whole documentary about dinosaur fossils. So you got to throw in some CG for them. Some computer graphic imaging here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> it is goofy, but it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Megalosaurus was the largest theropod or meat-eating dinosaur of its time. We don't really know that because we haven't found very many from its time, but yeah. It's the largest one we found, I guess you could say. Megalosaurus may have run at over 20 miles an hour as fast as a charging brown bear, but four times the size. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Megalosaurus uh. over a ton, the same as a small car. In order to sustain its body size, it fed on large prey. Uh oh. He's gonna steal his bike? Should have locked it up before he ran away. And then he would have gotten eaten, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And then Real Man Grow Beer says, why is a British documentary making a comparison to a brown bear? We haven't had bears for centuries, thanks to the nobility. Yeah, oh boy. Uh, um, I don't know. I. Yeah. Uh, this is a good question. I don't know. Yeah. Megalosaurus. Knock versus Lilithobo, yeah. Like any, uh, any big predator, 
Megalosaurus would have been opportunistic, so if it had an opportunity to scavenge, it would have done so, so it could save time, save energy, and it's a quick and easy meal. There you go. Yeah. We're gonna eat some garbage out of the wheelie bin. You don't think they're gonna let him into college? Delta Rain? The first dinosaur to be discovered in the world, and it lived right here in Oxford. Yep. Well, uh, Delta doesn't think he's gonna get into Oxford, though. You know, is Critter not gonna get an Oxbridge education? That's a shame. At least the original, original material you can see to this very day at Oxford, uh, at the Natural History Museum in Oxford. And holy cow, this is almost done. <gasps> oh my goodness! So I was in touch with uh, with the good folks at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and uh, they sent me the file for this. This is incredible. This is. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited about this. So excited about this. Let's let's finish up our video first. 167 yeah. million years ago. Very cool. Yeah. The remains of dinosaurs have been discovered all over Britain. Yeah. Anyway, so that's that. Our Megalosaurus. But let's go back to the part with the jaw here. There we go. Yeah. Is now housed in Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. Beautiful. Back when it was discovered, large fossilized bones had already been found in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. No one had any idea what they were. In China, they gave rise to the myth of dragons. In Britain, they were thought to belong to a race of giant humans. <laughs> well, Ellie, if there was one dinosaur specimen to rule them all, and this, this is it. Quite Out of all the, you know, Megalosaurus was the first dinosaur to be scientifically described. Way back in 1824, 199 years ago. Holy cow. And the most charismatic piece of that is this dentary right here. So how did yeah. And this, this is it. That's it. So how did they go from thinking that these were giant humans? Let's protect our fossils, because... If they're removed, America loses them forever. Thank you, Sloppy Salamander, for the, the Prime sub. I really appreciate that. Welcome to the community. Thank you for using that Prime sub here. I know you only get one of those per month. Appreciate you. Look, we're at 35 out of 40 now. We're just five away from our sub goal. Anyway, welcome to the community, Sloppy Salamander. Really, really appreciate you. Yeah. Cosmos says Chris Pratt belongs in a museum. Hey, if Chris Pratt wants a tour of a museum, I'd be more than happy to take him around. And uh, I agree, he does belong in a museum. We should give him a tour. Um, teach him about some actual dinosaurs, because heaven knows the ones he was interacting with in Jurassic World were kind of lousy. They honestly weren't very good. Anyway. They were dinosaurs. Yeah. There's a guy, Reverend William Buckland. He yep. was a brilliant geologist. Look at that jaw. Very well respected. He started to study these teeth. Tooth. Now, if you look closely here, you have this tooth coming through. Mm. He reckons. So I can show that to you in a few minutes. Once it's done printing, holy cow. Look, there's just the big tooth in the middle, a big dentary tooth almost done. You can actually see, you can see the little tooth peeking out from underneath it. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. This is a replacement tooth. He realized that reptiles continue uh. to replace their teeth. And he thought, well, instantly. This must be some huge extinct reptile. This was something completely new. An extinct animal. Very cool. In the Bible. That's so this has got to be the right dentary then. Because uh, that looks like the lingual side. Controversial for a man of the cloth then. Yeah. This must have challenged quite a lot of ideas for him at the time. Because indeed, this was something completely new. Yeah. Very cool stuff. If you'd like to learn more about the early history of dinosaur paleontology... Excellent book about that is this by Christopher McGowan, The Dragon Seekers. Uh, yeah, there we go. And I like the antiquated terms here. How an extraordinary circle of fossilists, as they called themselves at the time, 
discovered the dinosaurs and paved the way for Darwin. Of course, you got to throw in a Darwin thing, too. Chucky D. People know his name in the general public, so you got to throw it into a... Uh, yeah, into a subtitle that, like for your uh, for your proper book title there. But yeah, and this is Richard Owen up here. And that is... That's not Megalosaurus. Who is that? I think it's a monitor lizard that he's got there. But anyway, that might be Megalania, actually. But anyway. Yeah. Cadmos says, Forget Roger Ebert. We need an Iguanodon for movie thumbs up. Agreed. Uh, Cadmos. Yeah. Here. I don't have it here in my office right now. It's outside. But I've got a full-size Iguanodon hand with the thumb... Is tune in another time, and I'll, I'll show you. A 3D printed uh, Iguanodon. So we'll now have a 3D printed Iguanodon and a Megalosaurus. Very exciting. Very, very exciting. Yeah. And thank you, Kevin M., for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Here, let me check on something real quick, and then uh, we'll talk about the scan here. Yeah, excellent. Now, the whole reason that I can print this in the first place is because of this. Uh, pioneering technology sheds new light on Megalosaurus, world's first scientifically described dinosaur. This is from June 7th, 2017, from Sci News. State-of-the-art CT scanning technology has shed fresh light on Megalosaurus bucklandi, the first dinosaur ever named and described scientifically, thanks to new research from the universities of Warwick and Oxford, UK. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, very, very cool. Collected over 200 years ago in a quarry near the village of Stonesfield in Oxfordshire, UK, it's housed at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Um, using X-ray computed tomography, XCT, so an X-ray CT scan. Specialist 3D analysis software, Professor Mark Williams of the University of Warwick and co-authors took more than 3,000 X-ray images of the jawbone, creating a digital 3D image of the specimen. In an unprecedented level of analysis, they were able to see inside the jawbone for the first time, tracing the roots of the teeth and the extent of different repairs. Some damage occurred to the specimen when it was removed from the rock, possibly shortly after it was discovered. Records of the Oxford University Museum of Natural History suggest that some restoration work may have been undertaken by a museum assistant between 1927 and 1931 while repairing the specimen for display. There is the original fossil specimen there, and here is the 3D print they were able to produce after scanning it. There's mine right Beautiful. I had such an honor to be able to print this. Holy cow. The XCT scans have revealed previously unseen teeth that were growing deep within the jaw before the animal died, including the remains of old, worn teeth and also tiny, newly growing teeth. The scans also show the true extent of repairs on the fossil for the first time, revealing that there may have been at least two phases of repair, including different uh, using different types of plaster. Uh, being able to use state-of-the-art technology normally reserved for aerospace and automotive engineering to scan such a rare and iconic natural history specimen was a fantastic opportunity, Professor Williams said. When I was growing up, I was fascinated with dinosaurs and clearly remember seeing pictures of the Megalosaurus jaw in books that I read. Having access to and scanning the real thing was an incredible experience. Pretty, pretty cool. Um... Yeah, and I grew up seeing this too in just about every dinosaur book that features lots of pictures of dinosaur specimens. If there's ever going to be, if there, if any book is going to feature historical photos of different historical dinosaur specimens, you bet your posterior it's going to have this in there. Um, holy moly. Let's see, I've got this book here. This is a lovely compendium of different dinosaur papers from 1676 to 1906. 
Let's go to 1824 in here and let's find our Megalosaurus. Um, 1856? Too far. Uh, dinosaurs in the English domain. Let's see. Ornithology. Iguanodon. Let's see. Pterodon. Let's just look in the index. Shoot, it's going to take too long to do it live. Um, I could also just page through until... Oh, we don't have an index. Let's look at the table of contents. Uh, let's see. Should be... Iguanodon... Yeah, there we go. Notice on the Megalosaurus or Great Fossil Lizard of Stonesfield in Kent by William Buckland. The Reverend William Buckland, no less. Uh, page 51, and you will see this image there. There we go. Yeah. And there we go, Red. February 20th, 1824, on this very day, 199 years ago. There it is. Take a look at that. Anterior extremity of the right lower jaw of the Megalosaurus. Here it is viewed from the lingual side. So from the left side, this is like the tongue would be in here. So you're looking at the inside of the jaw, looking out of the animal's mouth, basically. And there it is seen from the anterior, from the front, looks like there. Uh, very, very nice. So yeah, big celebration stream next year, me thinks. I think so, Lenina. I think so. Zesty Fungi says, the victim view from the inside of the mouth out. There you go. Yeah. Anyway, really, really good stuff. Yeah. Um, very, very cool. Again, there's their 3D print that they produced after X-ray CT scanning this. Yeah. And, uh... It is almost done. How much time do we have left on the printer? Let me check the screen real quick. <laughs> Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, boy. This is exciting. Very, very exciting. Holy cow. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah. But anyway... Very, very cool stuff. And again, printing this non-commercial purposes. We're talking all about Megalosaurus today. We're talking about the importance of dinosaur discoveries. We're talking about the importance of museums. I mean, holy cow. The Oxford Museum of Natural History. Oxford University Museum of Natural History here. This case is all about Megalosaurus. There we go. Yeah, you can go see this to this very day. Uh, there's our original lower jaw right there. This is, to my knowledge, not a cast. I think that's the original original right there. That's why it's behind glass here. This was dug up more than, well, what was it, 1790 when it was first dug up? The lower jaw there? So over 200 years ago. This is why museums are so important. This is why they deserve our respect, our support, and our interest. This is why it's so important for museums to exist so that they can house fossils like this in perpetuity. The very first dinosaur fossil to ever be described, you can still go see it in a museum to this day. If we're in a, a private collection, that would be lost to history. You can guarantee it. It's museums that allow these things to actually, you know, be accessed in perpetuity. That's why museums exist, you know? 
not just to display things to the public, but to ensure that continuity there. I've dug up lots and lots of dinosaurs over the course of my career. I've never dug them up for private collections. Not about that, you know? It's not about fortune and glory. It's not about making money. It's not about, oh, having the coolest thing to put on my own shelf. It's about scientific discovery. It's about ensuring that these things will be there in a museum for hundreds of years into the future so that young paleontologists, you know, like maybe me now, 200 years into the future, hopefully there will be young paleontologists like me who are examining these fossils that I dug up for various museums, working on them and, I don't know, like so much of science, it's about being part of something that's larger than yourself, being part of a project that extends far beyond my own life or my own interests or desires. And I don't know, that's that's intensely meaningful to be part of a project like this, you know? So yeah, yeah. I don't know, that's what Megalosaurus means to me. It's pretty extraordinary. It really is, uh, to, be, to be part of this grand project. It, I'm at a loss for words, you know? It's such a privilege to be able to print this, too, you know? I mean, just looking at that, extraordinary. Huh. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Infinity Luna, which dinosaurs had scales and which had feathers? Oh, we're still figuring that out, Infinity Luna, holy cow. The best way is to find fossils that are actually have preserved skin or preserved feathers on them. But that's pretty rare, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. And there it is. Holy cow, it's complete. <laughs> oh my goodness. Here. Look at this. Extraordinary. So it's still got some supports on it, you know. The kind of printer that I have makes these supports, but I can very gently snap these off like that. And that is, holy moly, is that amazing. My goodness, it's coming off so cleanly, too. It is an incredible privilege to be able to print this. And uh, I hope you appreciate this. I hope this... I hope this means something to you, too. Um, just amazing. I'm going to clean this up beautiful. Oh my goodness, I am over the moon right now. To be able to, to hold a, a piece of, of the history of, of dinosaur paleontology like this is... It's hard to describe what I'm feeling right now. Um, yeah. Amazing. Truly amazing. And, uh, Holy cow. Really beautiful. <laughs> and I'm going to paint it Triceratops. Yeah, I'll get this all fixed up. It's going to be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we've been streaming for a long time. Five, five hours, 20 minutes? It is time for me to wrap this up on this note. So uh, let's wrap this thing up. Uh, we're going to run our credits real quick. Don't go away. We're going to go right into somebody else doing some science here on Twitch. Let's see who else is live right now. Yeah. 
And uh, thank you to everybody whose names are showing up here in the credits. You make these streams possible with your support, with your donations. I appreciate you more than I can say. All right, who else is live right now? Let's see here. Um, In all the world, there are fewer than 40 full-time dinosaur paleontologists. And holy cow, Sloppy Salamander! Three of them are leading this expedition. Subgoal completed! Thank you, thank you, Salamander. My goodness. That is extraordinary. Sneaking that right under the wire, Salamander. Thank you so much. I appreciate you more than I can say. Holy cow. Extraordinary. Thank you, Salamander. Thank you, everybody who got us there today. Really, really amazing. We're going to go raid Moo Hoodles in just a minute. Moo Hoodles also does science outreach streams here on Twitch. And, uh... Yeah, it looks like she's designing a game right now or something like that. We're going to go check in with her. But she does astronomy, astrobiology. She also really likes sharks. So if you've got questions about stars and planets or the sharks on our very own planet Earth, well, you're in for a treat. We're going to go say hello to Moo Hoodles. Um, but thank you, thank you, everybody, for a wonderful, wonderful stream. I had a fantastic time. Thanks for celebrating Megalosaurus with me. And, uh... Yeah. I hope you felt something today, stream. I hope you learned something, and I hope hope you felt something, too. It is such a privilege to be able to study these incredible animals that once ruled our planet, and, uh... Museums are integral to that. Thank you again to the good folks at Oxford for, uh, for letting me print this, you know? It's such a tremendous honor. Anyway, we're going to go tune in to Moo Hoodles right now. Thank you, thank you, everybody. I'll be streaming again tomorrow at 2 p.m. California time, so more paleontology live stream then. Don't miss it. Anyway, bye-bye, everybody. Thanks again. We'll see you around. There we go. Um, like.